Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Guest today is Kevin Goldsmith. Kevin, thanks for being here today. Delighted to be here. It's been we've been friends for a long time. Yeah, I'm super excited. Yeah. So, Kevin, um, first one, we're gonna talk about some of your hobbies, right? First, yeah. I want to talk about your photography hobby, right? Sure. On your website, you have like some beautiful pictures of like various countries you went to. Like, like is this like, are you like obviously this is a hobby because all the stuff you're going on, like, like your yeah. pictures like top notch, right? Can you talk about how you got interested in hobby and all that kind of stuff? Uh, it started when I was in high school. I uh, I had a job working at a library, putting away books, and uh, I started putting away the photo books one day, like the photo monographs, and started looking through them, and got really excited about them, and saved up for my first camera, um, which was a Canon AE-1 program that I bought used, uh, and over time got lenses for it, learned how to develop. So that started, you know, when I was 15, 16, or 16, 17. And just since then, just love taking photos. I've continued to move forward. And eventually I ended up working for the Photoshop team at Adobe and like working on digital photography, which, which was a dream. And so, yeah, no, I got, but I never got, I think I, I did do one set of one pro gig where I had to go take a bunch of photographs for money, but I never really thought about it. Yeah, I was trying to do it as a job, but I just always loved it. I just something fun to do. Just always. something to do yeah. for me, because um, I'll travel for work a lot, um, or just for fun, like going, getting up, and just going for a walk with a camera it makes you pay attention to what you're looking it at. Does, it, yeah, it gives you another level of of just awareness, and also sends you in different places. Like I'll, when I get to a new city. I'll just see something in the distance, like an interesting building or something. I go, all right, I'm just going to walk there and see what I see between here and there, which puts me in just random. I've been to the most random parts of Warsaw, Poland <laughs> or whatever, just because oh, that looks like an interesting building. I'll go there. And but it's, you know, it's it's just a great way to experience the city is just looking are, for are you still a Canon guy or have you changed products? I'm a huge Canon guy, okay. but um, I will say I got the Fuji bug a few years ago. I got like an X 100 S a bunch of years ago. And that has become more my traveling around camera. I still have my big Canon rig cause I, I spent a lot of money on glass and stuff, but these days I tend to travel more with the Fuji just cause it's easier. And cause there were, <laughs> there were a few times where like, I was with my family and they knew if I brought that, uh, if I brought the big camera, they're like, oh, all right, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta wait for you all the time now. Yeah. And so, you know, that just makes it less obtrusive, but yeah. So do you have like a portfolio somewhere with all your photography? Uh, just online. Okay. Your website. Um, yeah. Just on website. Uh, I think it's kevingoldsmith.com slash photo or photo dot kevingoldsmith.com. Um, and that's just where I put stuff. It's, uh, really just for fun these days. Is there like a, a certain place, a certain subject, you know, that you want to photograph, like a bucket list, so to speak, you know, like, like maybe, I don't know, Grand Canyon or Mount Everest or like the cathedral in Rome or something, you know, or something like that. I think if you, the things I want to photograph are, there's probably a direct overlap with kind of bucket list travel places. Like I want to go to Antarctica. I want to, I've been to Iceland, but I didn't, I was there for a very short period of time like to go back and just take photos um those are some of the kind of places i'm much more a nature yeah kind of travel yeah. yeah type of person so i like you know svalbard in norway kind of more you know out there kind of places um uh stuff like that so you've done a lot of traveling right can you talk about some of your best traveling places like your favorites and of course i want to talk about you living in sweden later on and other places sure right? yeah yeah, yeah um yeah. Your, your passport must be like 25 pages long <laughs> i actually i just renewed my passport and i had to early because uh over the summer my family and i went to uh switzerland and for a while like when somebody would open my passport they'd be looking make a point of showing me how far they were looking for a place to stamp it and in switzerland they're like 
we may not, we can't let you in. We can't stamp your passport. And I was with my family. I'm like, come on, like just there's there's a spot. Just stamp on top of another stamp. So when I got back from that trip. I had to like go and order a new passport because um, I'd run out of space. But uh, I don't know. You know, it's uh, there's a lots of there's lots of places I like. I, a lot of them are a place I just have really positive or good memories of. I really enjoyed uh, Sweden. I lived there. We'll talk about it, I guess. Well, I lived there for three years. I love going back there and it's a great place to visit. And I got friends there. Um, I going back to Chicago where I grew up and, and visiting there. Um, I really like, uh, you know, there's parts of rural like Normandy and parts of Northern France are really cool. I've only had the chance to go there once and it was amazing going to Mount St. Michel was like blew my mind as a place I'd want. It was one of those places I want to go for a really long time. Um, I like uh, Scotland. I like Edinburgh, um, Isle of Skye. I haven't been to in a real long time. We'll love to go back. Uh, Japan. I haven't been to Japan in a real long time. We'll love to go back. There's lots of places. Yeah. Your passport should have the place you have not been to versus the ones you've been to, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been lucky. I've been really lucky. Yeah, when I was when I was in the army, our family, I, you know, spent a lot of time overseas. Like, man, I'm a big fan of Florence, Italy. I love, oh yeah, I love Florence. I love Amsterdam. Uh, people would think Amsterdam like like a single city, but actually, there's a lot of things to do, like single and married, or single and married, right? Like that Anne Frank Museum. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice place both ways. It's it's hard to find a place anywhere to have a bad time, right? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot to be offered everywhere, right? Just had to just say I have open mind, right? You can't be like the ugly American, so to speak, right? Where's the where's my McDonald's at? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The best time I've had in places, I mean, amazing museums and lots of cities in the world, but honestly, the best time I've had in places is literally this thing where like, I see, oh, that looks like an interesting neighborhood over there. Yeah. I guess I'll walk over there and there's no fancy, you know, no funky bar or just whatever. It's just where people live, yep. but you get to experience kind of, okay, like this would be what, if I lived here, this would maybe be where I lived and this might be my grocery store. Just that kind of experiencing life as in in some other context is really interesting to me, even more so than, uh, you know, going to see this museum or that yeah. museum, you know. And plus, you got one of these tours, like tourism thing. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a schedule. You got to be here this time. You got to be here this time, right? And it's a bunch of other Americans with you or like, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. But if you if you go like kind of like go one off the beaten trail, so to speak, and see how people really live and get a real meal, right? My One of my favorite, I, 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 I I haven't done it for a while, so I can say it now, but one of my favorite things used to be when I would travel with my wife, because we'd go more kind of touristy stuff a lot of times. And I would always bring like a audio recording device. And that was really unobtrusive that have like a little microphone sticking out my backpack. And sometimes it was just to capture the bells or the water or whatever. But a lot of times it, I have lots and lots of recordings of just disgruntled Americans complaining about a tour or yeah. Like, oh, like oh, that food, like, I wish we had a McDonald's. This is, this is so horrible. And they're like in Florence or something. Yeah. You're just like, like, are you kidding me? Right. Yeah. I've yeah, had experience being in Florence or somewhere like, are you kidding me? You're in, you're in fucking Florence. Exactly. Like, look at all this, right? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, even, even if you just go to the, <laughs> even going to the, the, the flea market or in, in Florence is great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All oh, the I, art and stuff. And this, yeah, it's, it's I, ridiculous. Uh, I, my I have one of my favorite memories is in Florence. I've been there a few times, but um, we went with uh, my daughter was really young, and we were staying at a hotel, and they gave her like a little Pinocchio doll, and then my wife wasn't feeling well, so she stayed in the hotel room, and I took her to uh, the Uffizi. Mm. That's that's Florence, right? Mm. And um, so we go, and somewhere in there, she lost her Pin the Pinocchio, yeah. and she was so upset and so disappointed. She was really young at the time. And then on the way, somewhere in there, on the way out, I'm like, well, I'm sure they got a lost and found. Let me go check. And they had it for yeah. her. And it was just like the happiest day she nice. ever had. Yeah. And for some reason, like when I think of Florence, I think of exactly that. That's like the only thing I remember. Yeah. One time I went to Milan to visit. So I went to the I think called Old, Old Dumo, the Catholic the Third yeah. Rear. And we were just there by ourselves for the family. That's has to be some other Americans on a different tour. They're all rude and stuff, right? Yeah. I guess the town knows how nice you were. <laughs> and they took up us on the rooftop to this place where we're supposed to take us, and the view was just so just spectacular, right? Mm. And of course, I joke around, you can't find a bad meal in Italy. Like, oh, yeah. 
I mean, I, I will say Venice, you can find plenty of bad meals. But, yeah, yeah, but that's different. Yeah, but it's it's only because they're only serving tourists, right? Yeah, I mean, that's true, yeah. Because when I say it's in Italy, we're in Vicenza, like 30 miles west of yeah. Venice. People come visit, let's go to Venice. We try to convince them not to go right, you know, because it's, it's over heights and the water's dirty. And, but of course, you know, they don't want to go right. So. You, got, you got to go. You got, yeah. You got to see it. Well, you can't. We, we were lucky. The last time we went to Venice, we had friends. We were living in Sweden. We had friends who were from, one of them was from Venice, like okay. grew up in Venice. So they told us where to go. Yeah. And it was nowhere near anything. It was like we had to go and walk for like 45 minutes, but then we had amazing food. Yeah. Because it was where people live, yeah. not like where tourists live. I mean, that's like no one in New York City that lives there goes to Times Square to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One time we're, we're, in, we're in Italy, right? And they actually flooded, it flooded a, a what's that thing called? St. Mark's Square, I think it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah, That's it, right. It was like up to, up to your knees, right? How bad it was, right? Yeah. So, but it's a lovely place. It's it's amazing place. Yeah. So, is there a place you haven't been to yet? Like a bucket There's lot lots of places I've, I, yeah, there's more places I haven't been to still than there's yeah. places I have been to. So, yeah, I mean, I I don't, uh, I don't have like a, a map where yeah. it put pins and everything. I just, cause it's not usually, usually it's, I, I get invited to speak at a conference yeah. or something like that. Um, but no, there's plenty of places I've that I'm always excited to go. Yeah. So I went to Vietnam last year for 10 mm. in September. And so my friend Kevin, he's Laos, his wife, Mina's a Vietnamese. Yeah. And she ha- and she was actually born this stuff. So she's taking a, 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 co- a college degree program where import, export, market, whatever. And actually was going there for, for 10 days for the, for the school, right? And Kevin told me, Jam, Jason, come to Vietnam with me, right? I don't have a guy like, I'm not going to fucking Vietnam. Like, that's like <laughs> number 101 on the list of countries to go to. I have no, no desire to go to Vietnam. If you ask me again in April, uh, I'm good, right? Yeah. And then, so they'll find out on September 1st, August 20th, Jason, what the fuck are you doing, right? You have a chance to go to Vietnam. Yeah. You've never been to, with tour guide people. And, of course, the tickets were, like, very expensive there. So I just went, you know, we eat fam- we eat dinner every day with our family and stuff. It's just a, such a great experience, right? If you could go with somebody who's from there who knows it, like, oh, yeah. that's the absolute Oh, yeah. Best. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. But it's what you were not to eat at. It was a good experience. But one thing, man, those people are entrepreneurial, right? They're on the hustle, right? Like every, like every two seconds, buy this, buy this, buy that. You yeah, know? yeah. It, it was a good experience. And of course, you know, um, I call it the walk of death, right? We're like, you know, for people who haven't been in Vietnam, you might be at an intersection with like four streets, four sidewalks, whatever, four crosswalks. Everyone goes at the same time. Yeah. And what makes it work is no one really speeds. Everyone goes at the same pace, you know, but... Yeah, I was the 10 days never saw any, I, no, I don't think I saw anyone, anyone get hit or anything, right? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's different though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's a place you've been to that you, you really like that people are like, how in the world do you like this place, right? Like, like some place off beaten, you know, people like, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. All right, that's a good question. I have to think about that for a second. Like where, places I like that no one else yeah, can they, understand why I like yeah, them. Yeah, you know, like maybe I'm making this up. Like you said, man, um, the country of Somalia is the best country ever to live in, every day visit, you know. Maybe not, maybe not that extreme, you know, but, you know. I think, um, all right, because I was just there, and so it's kind of top of mind, and I'm actually going to I'm gonna be there again. Um, Munich, not that Munich's not a great place and people like Munich, but my experiences in Munich have all been, like, just spectacular, just super nice people. And, you know, it's not, they have, I'm just, I've never been to a museum there where they have, you know, they have tons of that stuff, but I like that great ice cream shop, yeah. like, you know, it's a, those kinds of things and just super nice people. Yeah. Like just the nicest people and really great experience. And, and so, yeah, that was, that's probably, it's not, that's not a nice place. Mm-hmm. It's just like, nobody goes yeah. there unless you're like yeah. a BMW fan or something. I think I've been in Munich four times, but each time it was for Oktoberfest, right? So, oh, sure, yeah. yeah so hey, no, and that's the funny part. Yeah. I've never been there for Oktoberfest. Yeah, I've never been to Munich itself, you know, of course, yeah. you know, but always Oktoberfest, and we're in four times, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But Germany has so many great cities, you know, Berlin, Wiesbaden, Frankfurt, you know. Yeah. I like, I like, um, actually, oh, or Mainz, uh, outside Frankfurt. Oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I was there for a week. Uh, I, I was stationed there, Wiesbaden. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just that's a little town. It's and so it's just nice. like, but yeah, it was a great little town. It's like the kind of place, if you were doing a tour, you'd stop for like an hour. Yep. Walk around, like go to a shop. And no, I spent a week there. It was amazing. So when you travel, do you like this? 
like suppose you, make this, suppose you go on a vacation next year, right? Do you like yeah. plan it out or you just say, Hey, I'm going to whatever let's go for vacations. It's different. Cause I'm, I got, I got my wife. So of the two of us, I'm the one that goes like, huh, we've never been to uh, another place. I want to go like, uh, uh, Newfoundland in, in Canada. I've never been there. I really want to go there. So I'll be like, Hey, we've never been to Newfoundland. Let's go there. And my wife will be like, well, we're you no, know, where are we going to stay? Like, yeah. what, what are we going to do? That's my wife too. Yeah. She she's wants a the, planner. She wants a detailed plan. Yeah. 10 months in advance, approved by 25 different people, you know, like it's, and to be fair, right. I've taken to her a lot of shitty things. <laughs> it's not for not without reason it's been like oh hey let's go to this thing that sounds fun and then she'll be like and it'll be horrible but then sometimes it's amazing like mm -hmm. and we never would have gone if we tried to research it you just take it i'm very happy to roll the dice and like sometimes it's not so great sometimes it's amazing she very much is like no life's too short i need to know that it's going to be a good trip yeah, this definitely be a balance, right? I think we're all going to trip for like someone took took charge of everything. Okay, wake up at four in the morning. We're going, you know, yeah, yeah, something, yeah. something, five in the morning, this, this, and this. Like, dude, no. It's, it's not even that. It's not it's not even that that she wants it so planned. It's just she wants to know, like, what we're going to the, you want to go to this place. What will we do there? I'm going to go look at reviews of those places, that kind of thing, because that's what she does. So there's the trips I plan and the trips she plans. The yeah. trips I plan are like, well, let's show up somewhere and see what happens. Trips she plans are like, Here's where we're going. Here's yeah. all the places to eat that are good. Here's all the, the places to see that are good. And both vacations, you know, tend to work pretty well. Yeah. Do you have any like travel hacks you can pass along? That I that I'm like uh, unique that people yeah. haven't heard a million yeah. times. I will say for the longest time, I haven't I haven't checked a bag. Yeah, I don't take no bags either. Uh, yeah. Not forever. And I've figured out. Um, I always travel with a Europe. I have a European size, like for European carriers, roll away. That's carry on. That's what I use. Um, and I figure out how to fit into it. Yeah. And I have done the thing. I wouldn't generally recommend it because it's, it's kind of a, it's very wasteful, but I have done the thing where like, I'll buy, like go to Target and buy a bunch of cheap underwear and a bunch yeah, of cheap t-shirts. Yeah. And just toss it. Yeah, in I, as I, I do go. that too. And then yeah. the part you say that like, is that really good for the you know the climate it's stuff? Not, you know? yeah. yeah, it's not. But so I I don't do that so much anymore unless there was one time where I did two weeks in Europe with. But I also had a bunch of stop. It was like multiple stops yeah. and multiple flights. And I'm just like I'm just only doing carry on, and yeah. I figured out how to make it work in that suitcase. Okay, but that's my one hack. Okay. Yeah. Thing, Which, yeah. but again, it's I'm not a genius. A lot of people. Yeah, but will you've tell been you traveling for a while, so I, I'm I'm still amazed, you know, where I'll meet people. You know, like I'm gonna be back in in Munich for this conference and bunch with a bunch of people I work with, who all live in Europe, and they'll bring for two days. They'll bring like a big suitcase. Uh -huh. and I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, well, what if I have? A, what if I need a tuxedo? What if I need exactly. this? What if I need this? And they're amazed that I'm just bringing this tiny little yeah. suitcase. And I'm like, I mean, if you really need it, you just buy it there, right? Right. And I'm like, yeah. That, there's always that too. I think that's the other thing. I'm never afraid because that sometimes that's the best experience. Like you go to a local store. Yeah, you're like, oh shoot, I forgot to bring these socks. Okay, I gotta go buy socks now. And it's like, wow, you yeah. you learn what it's like to buy socks in in some random country. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's a different different experience. So um. You also, are you like a musician or DJ? I saw your music on the website too. Yeah, yeah, I'm a musician. I have been, that's something else I've been doing for since I was a teen. Yeah. So is it like DJing or does it actually put, no, I, saw, no. I, I saw you playing some instruments. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not a DJ. Uh, I never learned to DJ. I play bass guitar is my main instrument. I played in a bunch of bands um, playing bass guitar, but I also play cello, um, piano, drum guitar now the last few years and are you self-taught uh yeah pretty okay. much i i i learned um i studied with a cello teacher here in seattle for many years so cello i i learned um when i was a kid in you know grade school orchestra i learned trumpet so i learned to read sheet music at least treble clef that way um but yeah everything else kind of self-taught and do you like like is this also a hobby for you like do you bust out the music, the instruments once in a bloom when I play them or like record yourself. Like if, if we were talking from like my, like office, like you just see 
everything behind me is music gear. Okay. Yeah, no, it's always at hand. And you play it like to give yourself a break and like like do creativity or anything like that or it's um so I you know, so I do technology, right? And and um I'm staring at a screen all day and typing. And so yeah, like photography to get outdoors or if I just want to do something else with my hands. Yeah, absolutely. Pick up the bass, pick up the guitar, just start playing. Um, I, because I played in bands for so long, I'm not sort of an idle, uh, I'll practice, but I'm not like an idle, just like strumming around. Yeah. I write songs and then I record all the parts for songs and then I release them. That also, because I work at a music distributor. Yeah. So of course I'm going to release them. Why, yeah. why wouldn't I? And yeah. so do you, do you release them on SoundCloud or, or Spotify or something different? SoundCloud, yeah. Spotify, Apple Music, yeah, yeah okay. all of those. Did you have to pay to release stuff on these platforms or you just release them? Ah, so good that you asked. No, I, I literally, I work for a company called DistroKid. We distribute music to all these platforms. And um, there's a bunch of different companies that do this. Our uh, the, the model we have that everybody else has adopted is you do a yearly fee and it's like, $22 in the US so it's you know like under two bucks a month and you can up distribute as much music as you want and I like, suppose this random band comes to you um do they do you have to approve the music they do or like no. okay it's not like you know like they're I'll make this up record like suppose they play only jazz or like, we don't release jazz or they only play no hip-hop. no so we're not a label right so so if I, I I ran a label for a long time I technically still do uh, no, that label was curated. Like, this is the kind of music I want. I'm going to invite, you know, I'm going to try and get musicians whose music I really like to be on my label. We're a distributor. It's, we work with labels. It's whatever you want. You can put up whatever you want. People put up audiobooks. You could distribute your podcast that way. It'd show up as a music, you know, it wouldn't show up in the podcast section, but you could do that if you wanted. Um, no, it's, it's, it's whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, we don't, we don't do that unless the things we do check for is like is this somebody else's yeah, like, yeah that kind of stuff. okay yeah and so like do fans just find you for example like two blocks down the central saloon i don't know if you've been there before sure you have yeah, yeah. so i'll go there once in a while i've been opening since 1892 so probably Nirvana, all these seattle bands started there before i got famous I you know? there. did yeah. you okay nice yeah i've been there like three or four times you know like, i think they still do a lot of music three bands a night right so if a band from play the band play tonight and they found out about you. How do they like go about getting on on the? Oh, it's super easy. You just go to the website, you sign up, and then you can upload songs. Okay. Yeah. So the band doesn't have to have a any like any so called cloud like you know downstreams. Someone could you know like make a song today. No one heard of them. Pay the money and put get put on the platform. Yeah, I mean, um, he's pretty well known you know now. But Oliver Anthony, the guy who did the Richmond North of Richmond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He recorded himself on a boombox. He, he I know, right? Well, he recorded that, stuff. That was on, amazing. Yeah, onto voice memos and on boomboxes, and he just you, and he distributed that like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, you want I would say if that's what you got, that's great. Um, if you want, you know, you want it to sound good, as good as you can make yeah. it, but um, because you want people to to listen to it. But, but yeah, no. You, so do y'all go to places like Central Saloon or like other like like any like plays a pit music and like I kind of scout as oh, hey Brandon band you sound really good let me tell you about this company we can help you out um no I'm not do- like we don't generally do okay. that um partially because I think one thing that just dis- like distinguishes us from a lot of the other companies that do this thing we're very pretty honest about about what it is and what we do okay uh, if you look at uh, I think and that's one of the things um artists appreciate about district kid relative to like some of the other um, folks, because they'll to tell you, we're going to make you famous or yeah. you're going to be the next Billy Eilish yeah. or you're going to be this. And we don't know. We say, this is what we, we do. do. Yeah. We hope you're going to do well, but we're not going to promise you anything that we can't deliver. On. So, you know, it's, it's more real. So I think for that reason, you know, we advertise and that kind of stuff, but we're not like showing up, like scouting, you know, yeah. showing up, trying to get one bad end at a time. So do y'all get a cut of people's output, like sales or anything like that? No, that's also the differentiator is you pay that fee, the yearly fee, and you get 100% okay. of your royalties, no cuts. Okay. Um, you might be able to answer this or can't for a reason, but can you tell us how many like is it people are on the platform? 
Yeah, there's. Uh, I can't tell you the exact number off top because I don't know. I don't remember the exact number off top of my head, but it's north of one point five million. Okay. All right. Nice. Um, and is this a pretty new company? Or has it been around for a long time? No, it's been around ten years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, a, is it based out of Seattle or somewhere else? No, it's it's fully distributed. There's a bunch of people um, in Seattle for the company. There's a bunch of people in New York, but people all over the world okay. that work for the company. Yeah. Remind me after this, though, a good friend of mine, he does my headshots for me. His son is like one of the top saxophone players in Seattle. He's actually yeah. Music City. He's actually releasing an album pretty soon. So I need to connect with y'all and maybe he can bring oh, sure. on your thing. Yeah. Yeah. If he doesn't already have an account. Yeah. 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 True. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, man. Um, so the, the music distribution, how's that, how's, how's that work? Right. So like, it gets disputed. Is it like, is it, is it like pretty much evergreen? Like it's on Spotify forever, Apple Music forever? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, how the digital distribution thing came about is, is kind of interesting. Like I said, I've been running a record label since for 30 years now, over 30 years. And so when I used to do, you know, I'd put out a record, I would put out a record. Like I would make CDs, I would send them to magazines and radio stations, I would ship them to a physical distributor. It's like a retail, like any other retail thing. Like if you sell cotton swabs, like you you send them to a distributor, the distributor sells them to stores, the stores stock them, the distributor catch gets the money and then they send you the money. Music was the exact same. There were music distributors. You would send them your music. They would con they would sell them to stores. The stores would pay them for the stuff they sold and then they'd send you the cash. When we move from like physical goods to digital goods, like streaming and iTunes downloads and all that kind of stuff, um, they these big companies, Apple and Spotify, like I used to work at Spotify and I worked on the other side of this like we ingested all the music. Spotify doesn't want to talk to like 10 million bands because that's a lot of people to support and they're each going to have their own weird, not weird, but they're each going to have their own problems. Like this doesn't work or why isn't this thing doing this thing? And so they just don't want the headache. So they early on, maybe originally were every once in a while they think, oh, maybe we'll have a direct relationship. And then they kind of move down that direction and go, no, this is too hard. This is really hard to do that. And so they use companies like us. And so what we do is we work with the bands. We make sure that their stuff is in the right format, that it's um, correct for all these different stores because each of them has their own rules. And then we supply it to them. They pay us. We pay. Do y'all track metrics for the artists? Like, you yeah. know, like, you know, they have this many downloads on Spotify, Apple Music, like terms of kind of like. We, we give them report. every, all the data we get. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all available. And you find most musicians, and of course, you know, there's a reason they, they say starving artists, right? Yeah. So do you think most musicians are, like, able to take that information and, and put it to good use, or? You know, it's a kind of thing, like, it, you know, hopefully, but, you know, it's a kind of thing, like, if you want to be serious about your business, right? Whether you are got a hot dog cart or whether you are a band, if you are serious about doing well, you got to pay attention to that stuff and you got to think about it. Right. And you got to be like deliberate. And so the information's there. Do they know how to use it? Do they know how to capitalize on it? Probably not at least at first, but then the ones who are, you know, the ones who are really trying to do this for real, figure it out. And it's not like that information is secret. Like what do you do when, you see plays happening in Boise or or whatever. Yeah, you go play a show in Boise. Yeah, exactly. Right? You know, like post, yeah. I'm making this up. Post, you have hundred thousand downloads, and like fifty, like half of them are like Boise, right? Yeah, you might want to plan something in Boise. Something you, you one, you want to find out what's happening in Boise, yeah. like that all my songs playing, but then you want to go and book a show in Boise and play because you know there'll be a lot of people. You have like a like a upgrade consulting option where like someone says, "Hey, I see all these numbers. I'm no idea with it," and they come to you and you're like, "Hey." We'll charge you extra money. There is multiple levels, and and uh, so the base one is that like twenty two ninety five. Mm -hmm. You can spend more. Um, mostly that's um, that gives you also more artist slots. So for me, I have multiple bands, right, for just different kinds of music that I'm making. So I use those artist slots, 
as opposed to one band mm -hmm. like that's at the base level and then there's more tools we provide at each that like help you take advantage of yeah. things or understand them better. so is there a breakdown i don't this is not the right terminology but is there a breakdown in your platform where it says you know 20 percent of band music is not here like unknown 20 percent are like kind of making it another percent is like you know kind of famous we know i mean obviously we know kind of the distribution of of like who's making a lot of money and who's making a little money and you know realistically most people don't make money i don't make money for my music right i've been trying you know i've made at various times made money but not a ton and but that's i'm also not like i used to play three you know three four shows a month go on tour you know put out a record every year to really try and 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 actually you know to try and do that and these days i don't i put out a song every few months you know whatever but you know again the the there's a bit of luck always there's a bit of luck from everybody from like taylor swift to to oliver anthony to to justin bieber there's a bit of luck that's involved in it and then there's just skill and n knowing what you're doing and all that kind of stuff as well but no matter how good you are at it you also got to have Bit of luck. Yeah, definitely luck. But of course, like, you know, work up to like, you know, people are talking about, oh, Justin Bieber, you know, he's only famous because Usher found him, right? Yeah. While Justin but, Bieber was like making YouTube videos, right? Put him on top of oh, yeah. right? I mean, it's. And he, Usher found him. Yeah. yeah. You know, of course, it's, I mean, so many things, you know, maybe Usher didn't turn on YouTube that day. So many things, right? It is a lot of luck, you know. And like Taylor Swift, people are talking about know, Taylor Swift, the billionaire, all this stuff she's doing, but. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I, no, I'm, no, no. Worries. I'm watching you. I'm like, oh, I need the mic. No, it's fine. That's yeah. fine. And, but people don't realize she was like, you know, writing songs like 15, 14, 16 year old, you know, like yeah. she's been hustling for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, it's funny, um, before I, before I had a label, I was on a, 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 in college, I was on a college radio station. And uh, at the time, so this is late eighties, early nineties, I think at one point I made a joke about Madonna, like this one, when she was still really, like still huge. And one of the other DJs, and like we didn't play Madonna at all. Like that was not what we played on our station. And he like yelled at me or he like cussed me out. He's like, You don't understand. Like she's a businesswoman and she knows exactly what she's doing and she's running her business. And you gotta respect it. Yeah. You may not like her music, but you gotta respect her. And I'm like, All yeah. right, I Madonna, guess yeah, yeah, Beyonce, right. Taylor Swift. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many people like, you know, like what I think what Jay Z said, I'm a I'm a businessman or something like that. You know, whatever you said, you know. Oh, yeah. And that is like, there's very few. I mean, maybe in the there in the 70s and 80s, there'd be these bands that like, you know, would make it big, but really weren't kind of, yeah. they let other people run, run their business. And a lot of those people are broke today because they made really bad, or they let other people make bad business decisions. But if you think about like the 90s, 2000s, yeah. like those people are on top of their yeah, of what they're doing, they know what's going on. So yeah. there's a guy named Brett Green. He runs a, a thing called New Tech North West. Like they do pitch competitions. He was on yeah. here about a year ago. So back in the day, he was the road manager for the Ramones, right? Yeah. And he was talking yeah. about how, like how cheap the one guy was. Like he like everyone else had big buses. You know, he like they were traveling like small vans with U-Hauls. Yeah. He said, "What are you What are you doing? Right? Live like a rock star. That's my money that I'm spending. Right? Yeah. I'm on money for my my kids, my grandkids. Right? I'm not doing this to be a big baller. Right? He, he like. I think it was Joey Ramon. I'm Joey Ramon. People know who the fuck I am, right? Right. Like, makes no sense, right? And then, of course, suppose they're, they're doing more financially now where a lot of rock musicians or music stars, like, struggle, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I, I, I worked with somebody once who, who was friends. I don't know if you remember back in the day. There was a band called the Cherry Pop and Daddy. Yeah. I mean, they had, like, a couple big hits. Huh? But he knew them from, like, he was a housemate with one of them or something from college. And he said, you know, he was telling me, like, oh, they still live with their parents and stuff. And yeah. like, they have this huge hit, and he's like, "Oh no, no," because they don't want to spend their money. They know this kind of stuff yeah. may just go away, and they want them, and they're being really smart. I'm sure all of them, if they did that, are doing fine. It's funny how everything comes back to startups for me. Like a lot of musicians, it's a startup, right? Like it is. Like so, um, Kid Rock was on Joe Rogan's podcast a couple of days ago. Let's do it. Kid Rock says, "You know, I don't know if all these songs right, but I only know for four or five songs. I have a 20 year career. Yeah, I've made." 1,121 songs that I've released on different records, different things. Only five of them people know off the top of their head, right? So that's the failure rate of 0.01%. Yeah. But off the five songs, I have a 
go play the bathroom. I have a, you know, hundred <laughs> acre ranch, you know, like, you know, you only got hit once, right? Oh yeah. I mean, there's, I, at one point I was going to, you know, write a blog post or something comparing, you know, venture capital and music. Cause it is, they're both hits driven businesses. They're both, you know, the, the label is looking for hits and they'll spend money. They'll put money in a lot of different places, but what they're looking for is the Uber. They're looking for like the, you only need one good. Yes. Yeah. You only need one of them and then you pay for all the other stuff. Right. And that was even true for me and my label. Like I, it was a passion, you know, it was, it was a passion project. It was more stuff I like more than stuff that I thought was commercial. But even then, like one of the bands did super well and more or less paid for everybody else. I mean, how many musicians have been playing on stage for like years and just so happens some music scout happened to be there that night and saw oh, yeah. them and like, you know. So many stories like that. So many stories. They were in the right place at the right time or they they bumped into somebody who was friends with somebody who sent their tape to somebody and all of a sudden, yeah. So this is my was a subject. So Napster, I'm a big believer of Napster yeah. would have been like 10 years in the future. They'd be like a billion dollar company right now. I think the time was this bad. Was Napster really a good thing, bad thing? What's your take on Napster? Napster was a bad thing. What I'm sorry. That? I'm like, yeah, no, it was absolutely a bad thing. So, I mean, their entire business was based on piracy. Mm -hmm. So, at, you know, as somebody who, who has a firm belief in, in the value that creative people have when they make something, yeah, like... Napster was all about enabling people to get stuff without paying for it. And so, you know, for that reason, yeah, no, Napster was a bad thing, right? And so they were ahead of their time. They were also of the time. If they had figured out quickly, you know, how are we going to, like, is there a way we can compensate artists for the stuff that they yeah. create as opposed to just making it easy for people to steal it? No, maybe they could have been. They could have been Spotify, yeah. right? Um, and certainly, like the having, I worked at Spotify for a bunch of years, and um, the early, you know, the Spotify early crew were all part of not Napster, but the like piracy movement. There's a strong like music piracy. They have a pirate party in Sweden, and they were all that way. But the genius of of, of Daniel Lack and, and Martin Lawrence and was to figure out like, oh, this is not good. You know, the Swedish music industry was dying, like, uh, you know, going under. And they realized we need to, you know, we could make a way to to do this while compensating people for their art. And you can argue, well, they should be paying more. And yeah, maybe, but they, for them, it was like zero or something. And that something has now made the industry more valuable than ever. So if you're an artist, was it better when it was like strict, like there's like selling albums and records? Or was it better now with the streaming stuff going on? The great part about now, um, you know, the great part about now is the 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 barrier to discovery is really low, right? Like if you think back to like when you were a teen or whatever, when you're first really getting into music, how do you find out about music? You listen to it on the radio, or you like your brother or your friend's brother like hipped you to this band like oh you should listen to this this stuff this is good that was how you found out about music it was always through very narrow things and so you discover what everyone else had already discovered right which is why i was so you know you don't think of indie bands from the 50s and 60s even though they <laughs> existed because no one knew about them. They, there was no way for them to get any kind of kind of press um but uh now like my kid like she listens to stuff she listens to random stuff like there's no way in a million years she would have ever known about or found because it's all available to her and when she finds something she likes she'll go deep in on it and like be, you know become fans of folks who are in their bedroom just making stuff they care about to like 50 people but that's like 50 49 more than they would have had you know, a long time ago. And maybe again, they get the right bit of luck. Maybe yeah. it becomes a hundred, maybe it becomes 500, maybe eventually it becomes a million. But just the fact that like, for me, you know, I can make something and you know, after work, I'm just like, oh, okay. I'm, that was, I'm, I want to 
just do something other than look at a computer. I'm going to go play guitar for a while. Oh, that's good. I'm going to record it, finish a song, put it up. And the fact that somebody in Sweden, somebody in France, somebody in Japan can go and listen to it and find it uh, is like, yeah. I mean, the, the amount of work I had to put in to like get a CD to a random store somewhere in the country and then get somebody to actually go into the store and buy it. Like you can't imagine how hard that was. It is so much easier. Yeah, one thing I try to do, I always find myself like listening to the same old music over and over again. So I do my best, like kind of like this, like you say, let's, yeah. try, let's pick random on Apple Music, just like listen to whatever. So one band I really got into recently is the band called Greta Van Fleet. Yeah. I really got to them recently, right? You know? Yeah. I like them a lot. I, I like They've been around for a while, you know? And yeah. I, and people say they're like the, the Led Zeppelin clone sort of kind of, you know? You see the resemblance, you know? But yeah, I, I'm a big fan of theirs, you know? One thing I think is really cool about music now that's that is i think kind of really different from music before so you know people will talk about like Greta van fleet being like oh yeah they're like led zeppelin ish they're led zeppelin maybe but then they bring in these other things they bring in these other influences like i think lord um when lord had her like big hit it was like the first time i'd really understood this like i saw it because i'm i'm old but, you know, I worked with all these, like, 20-somethings at Spotify, and they were into the, like, I remember Depeche Mode came to Stockholm, and I, you know, we got tickets. We got a pair of tickets, and somebody said, hey, do you want these tickets? I'm like, nah, I, I, you know, I'm, 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 I, I've seen them. Thank you. So I asked, like, oh, who wants them? And I figured no one would because these are all 20-somethings. They're like, oh, my God, I love Depeche Mode. I'm like, how do you even know Depeche Mode yeah. exists? Like, I liked them when I was younger than you. This is That was a long time ago. But they knew them. They were huge fans. They knew the whole like oeuvre because it's all available to them. And when you see her, somebody like Lord, and it's like, well, it's kind of soul and it's kind of R and B and it's kind of hip hop and it's kind of electronic. Billie Eilish is perfect, uh, exactly the same, right? They just, you know, th they have access to everything, so they can hear Patsy Cline, they can hear Public Enemy, and they can listen to it in the same playlist. And all that stuff, just like all these kind of barriers kind of break down and inspire just entirely new areas of creativity. M me personally, like I like, uh, like these days, like I listen to a lot of like semi like post classical stuff, but uh, there's so many like cool people doing mixing electronics and classical and kind of rock a little bit in in really unique and interesting ways. And it's not like it couldn't have happened before. It just didn't. Yeah. Not in the same way. I mean, good music is good music, right? Good music is good music. Absolutely. Bad music, bad music. Like, like I joke yeah. around, we're talking about Central Saloon, I've been mean like three or four times. Every time I go, there's a band that plays like, how are you not selling like hundreds of thousands of people right now? Like, oh, yeah. We, and then a band will come on like, you must have no friends. Because <laughs> like, right now my eardrums are bleeding because you're so hard recording. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'll say there's no bad music, just, you know, music that's not your particular kind Yeah, of that, that's, that's true, too. Because I'm probably guilty of a lot yeah. of that stuff. So. There's a lot of good music out there, right? Like, like me, a person, I'm like, people joke around, Tom call me a public enemy groupie, because I love public enemy. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. There's a big fan of theirs, right? There's so, so much good music out there. Like, right now, there's Olivia Rodrigo. I'm a big fan of hers. Sure. I've always liked Molly Cyrus, you know. It's, and, you know, it's just, you know, if you're good, you're good, right? But then again, yeah. like, how many, how many good musicians out there we've never heard of because they suck at business, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah, they, they, they weren't able to invite, in, invent a viral TikTok, TikTok dance yeah. to go with their record. Yeah. Or had a great guitar riff, like the Nirvana song, Teen Spirit. You know? Yeah. Or like Liz Zeppelin, Whole Lot of Love, you know, the, that catchy thing you, you need to have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on next, let's talk about public speaking, right? Mm. You do a lot of public speaking. Yeah. Which is, so which is kind of like an oxymoron because a lot of developer CTOs they have this you know, this mid stereotype that they in the in the computer room, introverts, you know. But you do a good job of putting yourself out there and teaching people, mentoring people. Talk about how yeah. that started. It started. Uh, it started. You know, obviously a bunch of years ago now, where um, I was invited to give a talk at an internal company meeting. And, uh, like we had an internal, I was working at Adobe. We had this thing every year, which was like an internal tech conference. I was invited to give a, a talk at it. And, uh, it was the first time I'd ever had to do it. I was super nervous about it, but what I realized was, um, there was some stuff 
I, you know, I, there was some stuff I knew that I could share and people appreciated it. Even if I didn't present it very well, you know, it was, I, it was something I've been working on that other people were, had heard of, but didn't know much about. And so I was able to share it and they, people appreciated it and they, you know, were very happy to learn something from me. Even if, like I said, I, I didn't do a great job speaking. That inspired me a little bit to think about, okay, like, you know, it very slow and halting, like did a little thing here, did a little thing there, did a, this thing, did a, that thing. And then um, eventually it kind of just reminded me of, again, like playing music, right? So I think that's one of the reasons why it became a lot more natural to me um, was I learned, I thought, I think about it like going to play in a concert, right? I've practiced the songs so i know like even if i break a string or something i can just keep, i'm just going to roll with it and keep going which makes you less nervous about it and then um and i also as i've gotten older i realized oh like i actually know shit other people don't because i've been doing this a long time and there's a value in that wisdom or just in the particular sets of you know situations i've been in i've learned something from and just being able to share that is, is, is to me interesting, but it's also valuable, but there's a whole other part that I'll, that I'll be really honest about. Cause you're right. Like computer people, like, which I am, like, we're not known for being extroverts or super public or that kind of thing. And I used to go to conferences to learn stuff or see talks and I wouldn't speak to anybody. And I still do sometimes, like if I'm not speaking at a conference, like, I may now, because I'm older and more confident, whatever, go up to somebody and try and talk to them and introduce myself, but, or like just find a subject to talk to them about. Cause I'm just, but I'll spend whole days like where I don't talk to anybody. I just go from thing to thing. Cause it's, it, I'm still very introverted and shy. What I learned is, oh, if I go up and give a talk at a conference, everybody knows who I am and they know what I know, or they know at least something about what I know. And then they come up to me yeah. and introduce themselves too, and yeah. talk to me. Yeah. And so for me, th that completely changed, like how these kind of events worked for me, because now I didn't have to like worry about going up to random people and trying to talk to them. People would approach me and that made it a lot more fun and a lot, you yeah. know, a, a lot more interesting. I'm the same way, right? Like. I'm an introvert, you know, but like, I love speaking in front of people, right? I love yeah. doing events and stuff, you know, like if I go to a networking event, I'm like, you're like, I might talk to people, probably not, but like I put on this eight, this startup conference last week. I did the whole thing, you know, I talked to people, they know who I am, right? Another thing too, yeah. I, you go to a conference, right? Or do you speak in front of a hundred people, right? These hundred people don't know you, but because you're up there talking, they, 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 okay, this guy's the subject matter expert. Yeah. Now, of course, some of us fuck up and, and you know, <laughs> and, and, and well, what we say you know, like, you know, like, okay, maybe you're not a subject matter expert, right? Yeah. In most cases, they're going to, you know, presume, okay, this Jason or Kevin, they, whatever they they know about it, right? Yeah. And that's when, when uh, other people, you know, want to learn how to be better speakers, and they'll like, a they'll ask me, like, how do I get, you know, I'm really nervous about it, or I'm worried everyone's going to know I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, the fact that you're standing on a stage holding a microphone or with a microphone on you and your face projected on a... Yep big projector means everyone in that room is going to believe whatever you have to yeah. tell them because yeah. you're the one doing that. Even if you're wrong, yeah. they're probably still going to give you the benefit of the yeah. doubt. You know, they're not going to judge you. They must it. know more than I do because they're yeah. talking about it. Yeah. But when you're nervous, you know, when you're inexperienced, you're like, you're assuming like everybody there is judging me mm -hmm. and they're like, yeah, that you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, one thing I do is always have like before, like even before I do the podcast or yeah. like, like my 12 third, I'm like 12 40, hope Kevin doesn't come. Right. <laughs> you know, what I want to do is right. Or like, when I or when I talk right, Kim before like, man, how do I get out of this? if I just leave? What everyone knows, right? And again, of course, like, like jitters go down. Yeah. And what's funny with me, like, if I don't have jitters or not nervous, I can I can't really fucking blow right. Yeah. If I if I'm like nervous as shit, like man, I, I'm not ready for this, then I do pretty well. It's it's I'm pretty at this point. Actually, no, like. Since COVID, like I was giving talks during COVID, but everything was virtual, right? So I never had to leave the room. And that was in some ways in its own nerve wracking because you can't really see the people. You don't know how many people you're talking to sometimes. So, but at the same time, you can't see the people. So it's not quite yeah. as nervous. 
But when I first, after COVID, and started giving talks again, I was really nervous. I started getting really nervous just because I'm like, wow, I'm out of practice. Like, how's this going to go? Um, but, you know, when you do it a lot, and I've been, you know, I'll, I'll say having, you know, given lots of talks, I'm not doing it all the time, but I do it, you know, usually a few times a year you end up seeing some of the, you end up like bumping into some of the same people. And so I'm friends with people who just do it for a living these days, like either because they work for a company, like as a evangelist or something, or because they're a professional public speaker. And you see how, e you know, how at ease they are and not that they're not, don't maybe have some in it, but you realize like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, okay. Like I don't have to be, nervous yeah. i just have to you know this i know what i'm doing i know how to do it i'm now at the point where i have i get in trouble sometimes because i will be you know sometimes i'm like a closing keynote and i'll be watching talks during the day and i'll go wow my talk's really wrong for this audience or this person said this and i really want to like double i want to echo that like yeah. add to that and so i'll rewrite my talk during the day while I'm watching other people and I end up like with a brand new talk at the, at the end of it that I present. And then the, the organizer's like, wait, you just did what? <laughs> Cause they're really nervous. Like yeah. they want you to give a good, they want yeah. you to give a good yeah. talk. But honestly, those are some of the best talks I've given where, and that, and I think it, it puts me a little bit on edge again. Cause I'm like, I, I, I practiced a talk. I came in really smooth, ready to go. And all of a sudden, like I just took the, took the <laughs> net away. Yeah, and I'm like having to do it. So I don't know. I mean, you you got to mix it up. Is your prof different based on the size of people you're talking to? Um, nah. Yeah, yes, no. I, I nah. Yes, no. Okay. So so, um, I gave a talk uh, at this conference in Munich um, in the fall, and that was about like three thousand people, in a big stage. That talk, I super practiced like i knew every and that was a talk i'd given before but i came in 100 percent practice because what i didn't want you know i wanted to be that speaker who could give a talk on a big stage to three thousand people mm -hmm. and be smooth right whereas sometimes if i'm giving a talk and i mean there's times where i've like gone to give a talk and there's like 10 people in the room and i'll just be like all right let's just talk like i'm not gonna present to you let's just chat like we can use my slides as, as a guideline but this will be better for all of us to, like to just chat so i absolutely will change how i do things based on the size of the room i'm in based on the number of people i'm talking to it, when you're talking to three thousand people you're not looking you know you can you're looking above their heads you're not yeah. looking at them because it's just too many when you're looking when you're talking to 50 or 100 people with you know which i do too you're looking at them. you're trying to see like am i resin like is what i'm saying working for you okay maybe not maybe i'm gonna yeah if you're something. talking someone puts a head down and take a nap probably not a good thing right yeah yeah well also <laughs> always at tech conferences too like there's just a you know there's 50 people on their laptops and you're like are you taking notes or are you reading your email like yeah so that's that's always tough too. yeah so when you speak is it as part of your any company you belong to or are, you, are you actually a paid speaker it depends. It depends on the situation. So um, sometimes uh, I will be like, I actually do two different things. If I'm representing my employer, yep, no, I use my employer's slides. I'm usually going to be talking specifically about something for the company. I'm usually there either with a goal of kind of getting new business for the company, or sometimes if it's more of a tech conference, I'm there to recruit. And I'll be, you know, it's, it's that spin is on it and how I talk about things. Then there's times where, no, I am a paid speaker. Um, there I use my own templates. I don't put my company name on it. Like I'll, I'll say who I am. So people know like, okay, like I'm, I'm speaking from a position of like knowledge or experience, but I don't talk about my company so much. I'm very much just there to inform or sometimes entertain. And, um, so it's very different. So I, I treat them very differently. And, and it's a difference too of like, if I'm speaking for my company, my company's probably flying me. If I'm speaking for a paid thing, I'm either, sorry, either I'm flying me there or the, usually the organizer. Nice. So 
let's talk about Sweden real fast because you're a big fan of Sweden. Yeah. Talk about talk about your experience in Sweden. Why you're such a big fan of Sweden? I well, I lived there for three years. So I went to uh, I worked at Spotify in Stockholm for three years, and uh, it was, you know, that was my first time living abroad. I certainly traveled, but that was my first time actually like living anywhere else in another country. And um, it was just this experience. One, it's a beautiful country, wonderful people, amazing, you know, government, great, great place to live. Um, but it was also the experience of, I was talking to somebody about this earlier today, actually, like you're in this place where I, I know, you know, I, I've been in Seattle 30 years. Um, I know how to go. I know where, I know 15 different grocery stores within three blocks, of, you know, within, within a mile of here. If I know I've been to every bar on first Avenue, you know, over the years, right? Like, Oh, like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I remember when Peter Miller was down the street, uh, you know, up in Belltown, I used to go to Peter Miller all the time. Oh, maybe I'll go to Peter Miller on the way back. To the car. I know this place. I can walk. I can walk Pioneer Square blindfolded. You go to um, you go to another country, and it's this thing, like I said, about like buying socks. You go to the grocery store. The grocery store is the same, but it's different. Like how it works is totally different. And you find like all these things are just automatic. You have to rethink. Like this is okay. How do I? I don't know how to do this here. I have to learn again, like from scratch. That experience also helped me, you know, it was an important part of, of that. But um, why Sweden in particular versus France or Germany? Well, that's where we live. Um, but also it's just a really, um, it's a country that cares a lot about fairness, about it's, it has certainly like there's rich people and poor people, but they don't think about themselves that way. There's this principle in Sweden called la gom, um, which is sort of just enough. And so not only where you work, like the CEO versus like a uh, entry level worker, they all see themselves as like we're, we're peers. And it's the same in how the government treats people. It's the same in how things work. Um, the, there's, it's a very, you know, it's very safe. It's, it, it's got tons of culture. It was just a great place to live. Well, I'll be honest, when I think of Sweden, the word poor never crosses my mind. Yeah. You know, like I think of Sweden middle class at a minimum yeah but and but and that's because they have like a very strong social safety net right like it's not like there aren't people living, you know earning not a lot of money but the country would say like why would i why would we let somebody live on the street like why should that be okay yeah and so they make sure that doesn't happen right they make sure that that isn't a, a choice people have to make so is Sweden considered like a capitalist country socialist country or something else or? it's a it's a capitalist country it's and it's it's a social democracy okay right so so it's a democracy with a strong social safety okay. net right? i know if you like all these like these reports out there like you know what countries have the best freedom score best yeah business score i mean we didn't know way actually go way higher in the United States. No, the Nordics. Even oh, though yeah. supposedly we think of those like socialist countries, right? Yeah. They go way higher as far as entrepreneurial stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's also really interesting. This was something I didn't quite expect. Um, and I, I don't know why, but when I got there, it's also, I mean, a relatively small country, right? So so the 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 population of Sweden, the entire country is probably the population of the Puget Sound area. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like 10 million people. I thought they had like 30, 40, 50 million. No, it's like 10 million people. I, I had no idea. And, um, you know, and, it, and so the amazing part of that is, okay, like the, the, within the first year, I think I got interviewed for like the, the a managerial magazine. I'm like, well, how, like, I don't even know why you're talking to me. <laughs> like I just showed up and I'm pretty sure there's like a lot of other people in the country. And they're like, well, no, you're, you're very interesting. And they'd heard, I don't know how they had heard about me, but you know, it's a, it's a country. So it has all the jobs every country has. There's just not as many people doing them, which means that it's really easy to kind of stand out. So it is not hard to become one of the most interesting startups in Sweden. There's a lot, but there's not as many as like here. Yeah. Right. And so it's, there's sort of an escape velocity that you can get there just because there's less competition. And that makes it really interesting. 
And it's the same with all the Nordics. It, it's one of the interesting things about Europe generally. Even like a country like Germany was like more like 50 million people. Um, you know, not that it's easier for them. It's still hard, but it's easier for them to stand out just because there's not as many, right? Whereas here, there's just so many. If you think about the U.S., there's just so many. To get known, to get seen, to get visible is just a so at what age did you start getting um, interested in doing tech stuff? Oh, from a little kid. So uh, my school got a computer when I was in fifth grade. And like we had a, didn't have a class or anything. We had a computer club after school where we'd all take turns on it. And I was done. I was, I was in love. Like this was the best thing ever. So what job was it or what event happened where you're like, you know what? I'm pretty fucking good at this. I can make a lot of money doing this as a career. Like, this is what I'm doing with my life. Well, the interesting thing to me um, was, you know, it's not like now or, or, or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. When I got interested in this and decided, like, this is what I want to do. And I knew that by, like, eighth grade. I knew, like, seventh grade or eighth grade. I knew this is what I want to do for a job. Um, it wasn't a, wasn't a make a lot of money kind of job it was very much a no it's a solid middle class lifestyle it's like go you know be in the basement of some large corporation like doing the computer stuff and you can maybe afford like a you know a, a split level ranch in the suburbs kind of kind of place but it was so it wasn't about the money it was just i really liked it and you know as i got into kind of out of college even as i got out of college like Everybody, I, I went to computer science at a really good university. All my class went to, you know, I went to go work for this big company in, in California. We either all ended up at big companies in California or big companies in New York or some went to like uh, Detroit and worked at the, you know, co motor companies and stuff. Nobody was going and nobody joined a startup. That wasn't really a choice or an option. But within a few years, it became so. So it really was... Like it was never a money thing. It was always just, I really enjoy it. This makes sense to me. Um, it's something that, you know, for me, it was just a lot of fun. It was just a fun job. Yeah. Tell me if you agree or disagree with this. I wish I could remember where I read this article who wrote it. This guy wrote an article where basically he said, like, you know, a lot of people think software development is a white collar, but in my mind, they're blue collar because it's like the trades, like the back mm. day plumbers, electricians. Because if you're coding, you like you're coding, right? Is that more of a trade, right? What's your opinion on that? Or is it, more like white collar i think people think of it as white collar because it generally does make a lot of money but no i, I think that resonates with me in, in that it's blue collar it's a trade you have to learn the skills um just like a just like a plumber just like a pipe fitter you're constantly kind of examining you know trying to figure out what why something's not working or whatever i think the so there is an analogous thing there. I think it's something you can learn. And now like they do have uh, the equivalent of like, um, you know, training programs where people can train to do that stuff. I think the, I'd have to talk to more plumbers and electricians and that kind of thing. The one thing I'll say is un it's can be probably one of the most frustrating jobs. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that later on. Yeah, yeah, it can be one of the most frustrating jobs, I think. And uh, with an, you know, being an electrician, yeah, sure, I'm sure you can have a bad day. But it's per, I think it's hard sometimes to have a day where, you know, each day is different because you're in a different situation. You're looking at a different thing. You're looking at working on a different project. Computers, no, you're working on the same project sometimes for months and months yeah. and years. And it used to be. And every day sometimes it's just like, some days it's like you're the king of the world and some days it's just like a endless slur series of slaps in the face. So those out there, like software developers solve problems, right? Yeah. But do they really, do they solve problems or are they being told what the product manager tells them to do or the senior dev tells them to do? It depends, it depends on the company, it depends on the company culture, it depends on the, the kind of situation. I think a lot of companies, uh, so there are companies exactly in the world where somebody's telling you go do this thing and then tell me when you're done and i'll tell you the next thing that's not a lot of them 
partially because um, this is a, I, I certainly believe um, computer programming is a skill you can learn. I also, though, firmly believe some people enjoy it, some people don't, right? And and for some people like me, you have the kind of brain where it makes sense to you. And for some people, you can kind of do it, but it's not necessarily inherent in you. And because of that, it's always been, there's a reason why, even now, like we have a big downturn in the industry, lots of people getting laid off. There are lots more people doing this job now than ever before. It's always a job seekers market. And for that reason, um, a lot of companies kind of have learned if we're, if there's just, if you're just getting orders and doing what you're told, you're going to go quit and work someplace that they don't treat you like that, where they give you more freedom. They give you more autonomy. They give you more creativity, more control. And so those kind of places largely aren't around anymore because everyone's like, I don't want to do, why, why would anyone want that to be their day? So they go find places where they don't, aren't treated that way. And, um, but I think that still exists, but it's not, it's not quite that. It's not certainly never anywhere I would, I would work. So to follow up on that and, you know, just speaking generalities, so like maybe a few years ago, there was like hundreds of thousands of software developer jobs everywhere, right? Yep. But now it's still like, you know, do developers or like, if you're develop, do you develop now? It's not like you're struggling, right? To find a job, right? Yeah. How did this switch happen so fast? It's economy. It's other stuff. So you know, this is the my industry is cyclic. Like every industry is cyclic, and I've been around long enough where I've seen it cycle multiple times. I was, you know, I was at a startup in 2001. Startup went under. No one was hiring. Took took me months to find a job. Right. I was lucky. I was working. I had a good job in 2008. Didn't, didn't that downturn didn't affect me, but affected a lot of people I work with. Now we kind of have the COVID downturn. What happens a lot is money's cheap. There'll be these cycles because it's also cycles of investing. Money's cheap. Uh, companies hire, maybe like during COVID, some companies were growing much faster than they expected. Uh, so they started hiring a lot. All right. Economy changes. Like, their business goes down. Now they've overhired and they lay off. And if they all do it around the, and once somebody starts doing it, it's like, Oh, okay, great. Like we can do this and not get in trouble. Like we don't want to carry this many people. We want to get, um, we want to improve our, our margins. So then other companies start doing it. So what ends up happening is a lot of people get laid off all at once. And then if I'm hiring and I have a choice between hiring an experienced person and underpaying them, or hiring a junior person and paying them that same salary, I'll hire the senior person because I can get them and they'll take the job. And then hopefully what happens in another couple of years, investment starts coming back in and those companies, those developers like me, I was one of those in 2001, 2002, took a job. They undercut my salary because they could and I took it because I needed a job. And then a couple of years later, economy starts, the economy's back, the job seekers market again. And then I go work somewhere else and I get, you know, a, a back to where I should be salary wise, because now I know like I can't, you know, I've, I've taken too low a salary. I need to go find a, a, a salary that I'm happier with. Um, that'll happen hopefully again. That's kind of a cycle I've seen multiple times. Is us. there a way for developers to protect themselves against this? Like make them stop? like indispensable to the company or just like improve their skills or something, or it's just like the nature of the beast, so to speak. It, I mean, this is another place where it's kind of, you know, being good at what you do always helps. Uh, continuing to learn, not getting stuck. Like this is a, you know, we want to talk about other trades. Other trades are also interesting. Other trades continue to evolve. Plumbing today is different than plumbing 20 years ago. Software development today is different than software development three years ago, right? This is still a really young industry and it's changing really quickly. So keeping up and just paying attention and being aware and keeping your skills up, most important thing. And it's easy to get kind of stuck doing something and watching the world kind of, and the world kind of passes you by. And then all of a sudden 
you're an expert in this thing that nobody cares about anymore. And then when you go looking for a job, nobody needs it anymore, right? So keeping your skills up, keeping aware of what's going on in the industry, super important. Being good at what you do, always going to be helpful, right? Networking, knowing your friends. I haven't had a, I haven't gotten a job in years and years where it isn't that so I don't know, you know, somebody I know wasn't at the company or somebody I know got approached and said, Hey, I'm not looking, but you should go talk to Kevin. Right. For years. And I have the benefit of having been around for a long time. So I just know a lot of people like I'm an introvert. I'm not a great networker, but you know, that's one of the things I always tell people. Cause also, um, you know, when I worked at Microsoft or when I worked at Adobe, I worked at Microsoft for like eight years. I worked at Adobe for nine years. When you're in those bubbles, you're in a bubble. Like you have no idea what's going on in the world because everyone you talk to, everyone you see is your, it works at the company with you. And so you don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. And there's things I, like, I had no idea. I mean, I knew cause I was kind of paying attention, but I didn't really know. And now since then where I've been in startups and I have lots of friends in lots of different companies, I'm way more aware of what's going on. And sometimes I'll get one of those people that's been at a company at Amazon or Microsoft or one of these companies for a bunch of years. And you talk to them and their conception of how the world works is a hundred percent like Amazon. And they don't really understand how stuff works in the real world. Right. Because they haven't had to, because they have no exposure. Any so that's advice? the other part yeah, is just paying attention. Any advice for developers out there who know they need to work, but they're introverts, they don't know how to do it, but they know, man, I need to put myself out there. So meetups are great. Now that we're doing them again, um, meetups are really good. Like going to whatever, especially in an area of technology, like you're interested in, like find a meetup. Because if you're in a, if you're lucky enough to be in a city like Seattle, there's tons on all sorts of different things. You can go meet a bunch of people and usually the, you know, they, they make it easy to meet people there, right? You can go and sit by yourself and talk to no one, but usually there's, there's an effort to make it easy to talk to people. Uh, that's a good way. Another good way, join an open source project. And that's a non like person to person way, but now you're kind of interacting with people. You're, you're, they're code reviewing you. You're on mailing lists together where it's a little bit lower barrier to entry, a little bit less scary or intimidating, and it's kind of about the work, that's another good way to, to meet people and network. So this has kind of changed a little bit, but like if you're in a city like Seattle, mm. I think no matter what your economic demographic is, you have, you have opportunity to go to meetups, different things here in Seattle, yeah. right? So I think you're advantage. Where if you live in, let's say, you know, backwards Arkansas, yeah. a town of 50 people, and I was interested in tech except for you, like, is there a way, like, like you know, equalize that or give people in the rural areas more opportunity? Or is it like this matter, you know, is this unfair advantage people like big cities have? I mean, you know, the in-person opportunities in a, that kind of environment is, yeah, it's always, it, it's not going to be as beneficial to you. Doesn't mean it, you can't do it, but you might have to travel further to do it. You might have to do the virtual things. There's tons of these virtual events. The problem is, you know, especially if you're introverted, the it's so it's like I attend these sometimes and like, I, yeah, you're not talking to anybody because you're always, you know, you're watching somebody else give a presentation pretty much. And there's a comment section and it's hard to like have a convert. You can't really have a conversation there. So it doesn't work as well. If you were in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, I drive to Bentonville and go to Go to some of the uh, go to some of their events because I know they have them because I work with people from Arkansas, as, as a matter of fact, and one of whom lives out in the middle of nowhere, but will go into Bentonville to like meet up with people because because of Walmart being there. There's yeah. a big tech, I forgot I forgot about there big tech community about, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. So, what's your take on coding academies? Right, I mean, some yeah. people say coding academies are good because they're putting developers out there. Some people will be say they're bad because they're selling dreams. That's not reason. Like, like a lot of coding academies, in, yeah. In you know this exaggeration, of course. One week you'd be a full stack developer and make two hundred thousand dollars, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I love. I mean, I I have been very publicly supportive of code academies, but specific ones. 
um because there are there's a you're absolutely right there's places you know like i said like one of the things we don't do at distro kid is say like be on distro kid you're going to be rich and famous because we can't promise you that because no one can promise you that so we don't say that right so if a coding academy says you're going to make two hundred thousand dollars next year i'd say don't go to that coding academy my favorite places my favorite ones of those i mean there's some great ones um, Code Fellows in Seattle. Um, uh, there's a, another good one that are more like kind of sign up and pay for it. But I, I'm a huge fan of the Ada Developer Academy here. Learn, I guess now they're national, which is focusing on on uh, female and non-binary folks. Um, that has a very rigorous program, and they pay you or at least it's free and you get a stipend to like go and do it because really what their focus is, is bringing more underrepresented people into the industry. The other one I really like is Apprenti, is the Apprenti system, which is an apprentice model system that's run by the Washington Technology Industry Alliance. Huge fan of both those, same thing. Their focus is, um, Apprenti focuses on ex-military and also underrepresented groups. So trying to get these folks training to get to get work and they work with employers both these programs i'm huge fans of but the other ones i'm i'm a big fan of too i think again it's are they actually giving you the skills you need are they helping you find a job and and uh you know who who are they focusing on because i care a lot about underrepresented groups in tech seeing as a white cis dude um who who's seen the the problems of working a lot of large companies with a bunch of white cis dudes. Um, I appreciate that. And I think it's important for the industry. And so I appreciate those folks, but if they are serious about training you and they're serious about what you can achieve with that training, then I'm, I'm a fan. So if someone paid to become a developer, like pay a code academy or get a four year mm -hmm. degree, or should they just go to, you know, quote unquote YouTube university? And does it, does it really matter? Um, it depends on you. So there are plenty now. I mean, you know, I had to go to university. There's no way I was going to learn on my own. There was no YouTube. There's no internet, right? I could buy, you know, the four books that existed on programming, but, and maybe taught myself, but probably couldn't have gotten a job that way. So I went to and got a degree. Um, that is no longer required. Helps no longer required. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why I support these coding academies, uh, because I do think certainly and a lot of the entry level jobs in tech totally don't need a four year degree. Again, if you have one, that's awesome, but I don't think it's re really required. There's a lot of stuff we do that, especially coming in at entry level, like, yeah, you don't, oh, there's a lot of stuff you can do without four years with a couple of years of training or eight, six months, if you've got the right aptitude. If that's not the best way for you to learn, you got other things going on, like you got people you got to take care of, or you don't got the money to do it, you need to work your job. And you have, you're willing to work, put in the work, watching the YouTube videos, there's plenty of free courses online, including from like MIT or Stanford. If you want to like work with them, if that's the way you want to do it, and that works for you. Yeah, awesome. The hard part, again, is still the credentials help get that first job. Yeah. Once you got that first job, the second job is based on your first job. So it's really just about getting your foot in the door where having that degree usually helps. I think because of the school I went to is well known for that stuff. I think that still helps me to this day, but I work, I, I'm the only one I know that I work with that went to that school. There's plenty of people that went to schools no one's ever heard of that, that are very senior at lots of companies. I think one great thing by being a developer, like age doesn't matter, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, like most industry, a lot of industries, like once you have a certain age, your skills are great. But like favorite story I like to tell, I was on YouTube one day, just going on a rabbit hole. I was some kind of the free Python course. Yeah. And this guy, he's like, hey, you know, because someone's like, am I too old for this guy? Like, hey, I'm 75 years old. I learned Python at 70. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Yeah. Like, Man, this is so fucking cool. Right? This dude like started. He learned Python at 70. I had no experience with this. I just wanted to do something different, you know. Now he's like, I'm gaming, I'm doing other stuff. It's so fucking cool. Like, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, like, most industry, I mean, I don't think you can say, I'm a 70 year old dude, I'm going to be a plumber, right? Or, you know, right. it's, it's, yeah. but anyone, any age from like 
eight to eighty can be a developer. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think what's funny, there was a long time I, I used. To, I don't look at Quora these days anymore, but I used to read Quora a lot, and uh, some and somebody would always ask every once like every week or every couple of weeks, somebody would ask like, "Hey, what do programmers do when they turn 40? And like, what do you mean <laughs> they they're still programmers? And but people were convinced because the 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 uh, the the idea is like, oh, programmers are like twenty somethings wearing hoodies, like sitting in dark rooms. It's like, no, nah, man. Like, I worked, I you know, I worked with people who were sixty and been programmers for forty years, and we're still programmers working at Microsoft or Adobe, and we're on top of their game. Like, we're amazing at what they did. It's like any other job you're way better at the, the more you do it, even though like the stuff you're doing is totally different. Like the stuff, my teams and stuff I do today is so different than what I did 20 years ago. Everything I learned then still informs me now. It's like the wisdom of, of doing the job in the same way. Like, by the way, like a 65 year old plumber. Yeah. He's seen a lot of shit. Like he knows <laughs> this is this weird thing. Water pressure is weird. Like, you know what? I think I've seen this like a hundred times now and maybe it's a little bit harder to like get behind the wall and get yeah, to kind the of thing bit down. Yeah. To do that stuff. But at the same time, like you have the benefit of that experience. So yeah, it's yeah. So from your point of view, when should or when can a junior developer to say, you know what, I'm a senior developer now, or does someone else decide that for him? I think somebody else has got to decide for okay. you to be okay. honest. And, and, and one of the things I think that, you know, compared to, some other industries, right? It we're weird about it in tech because it is very much like a company by company thing. I, unfortunately, I think we've completely diluted titles so much that they're more or less meaningless at this point. So it's not like the military, right? If you're if you're a sergeant in this team and you're a sergeant in this other team yeah you kind of there's some things that you have to have that are required in both places because the army is going to make sure you have those skills right and there's a whole bunch of testing to make sure that you qualify in tech like this startup goes hey you're two years out of college you're a senior developer and then you go to microsoft and they go you're not a senior developer. Are you nuts? Like, <laughs> you're like, no, like come. You're, you're barely junior. Yeah. You're, 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 yeah, barely, you're barely internship level. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're basically an intern. You got to work yourself up to junior and maybe in 10 years, you're going to be a senior. But that kind of, because like one startup will go, well, you're a senior because you've got one year of experience. And this other startup is like four years of experience. There's a bit of a downward pressure on titles and that's been going on for a long time. So I don't know. I mean, how many startups have like VP or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm a VP. Dude, you, there's four people in the company. How, how are you a VP? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, so I was at a startup and uh, I was a director, a director of engineering at the startup. I managed no one, right? You directed yourself. I directed myself. But, you know, I'm in charge of one person. That was my title. And I went to, you know, the startup went under. I went to go, I went back to Microsoft. And, and they're like, well, you know, this is going on. I'm like, well, I was a director at this other thing. And they're like, yeah, no, it doesn't count. Like, no. <laughs> how many people? Oh, you were a director. Oh, how many people did you manage? Uh, none. Okay, yeah. No. That's not the definition of director. That's not a definition of director. We, you know, but even like between, you know, I was director at Adobe. I managed 50 people. But, you know, Google? No, that's not a director. You got to manage like 150 and then you're a director, right? So... What do you look for when you hire people, either tech or non tech people? Is there like values you look for, certain characteristics, or is it based on the company you're at? There's a, I mean, there's always going to be something based on the company you're at. You want to find somebody that's going to be a good fit in the company and like a culture fit or a culture add. But if there's one thing that I am continue, there, there's, if there's one thing I'm looking for is pragmatism. So what I, and, and it's really just like, you know, do you, when you're facing a problem, do you go, well, this is what we do when we solve this problem? Or do you go, all right, let me figure out what the situation, what makes sense here? How do you do exactly, you know, as much as you need to do and not overdo it or not underdo it? So it's really just being flexible. It's being that kind of thing. 
everything else to me, you can pretty much teach. If there was a sec, if there was a number two, um, it would be, uh, you know, just willingness to learn or excitement about learning. Because again, like if you don't know a specific skill we need, but we can teach you and you're excited to learn it, you're going to be awesome. Um, if you're willing to do that and you go, well, I need to know this much to do this thing and I don't need to do more than that. So I'm going to learn this much and do the thing. And if I need to learn more, I'll do that then even better. Is there like a standard career path for developers, like, you know, junior developer, senior developer, lead tech person, CTO, VP or something, or is that different each place? The cool thing about tech um, has been that over the years now, it's become really much more common. It used to be like a lot of industries, like you're an individual contributor, more senior individual contributor, more senior individual contributor. Oh, now you're a manager and now you're on the management path. So for a long time now, and it was originally at, at kind of companies like Microsoft or Adobe, where you'd say, no, like you can stay an individual contributor forever and continue to get more senior forever. Or you can choose to go onto the management path and then grow up the management path. So that's, I think, a cool thing about tech, which is like, if you don't want, if you're not a good manager or you don't want to manage, it's not something you care about. Okay. Well, no, you just become a more and more, more senior individual contributor and you can do that forever and you can get raises, you can get promoted, whatever. Or if you say, you know, I like people or I'm interested in people problems, I'm going to switch into management, then you can do that. So on the individual path, like you end up usually at this kind of terminal position, which is usually like an equivalent to a VP or something like that. You'll be a fellow or you'll be a principal in some companies or a staff level person in some companies, um, or you're on a management path and you are maybe a team lead, then an engineering manager, then a senior engineering manager, then a director, then a senior director, then a VP, then senior VP, and then CTO. So it's not like your career, you've done a good job, like, you know, corporate job, yeah. startup job. So you almost go back and forth. Is that by design? Is that, or is this happened like that? Just happened like that. <laughs> so, well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, like I said, when I graduated college, there were no startups. You, you, it was just a question of how big a big company were you going to go to, right? So I went to a relatively small, big company. It was like 3,500 people, right? Um, Multi-billion dollar company. And so did that for a little while. And actually I left, if there's a pattern in the early part of my career, big company, little company, I left that company and went to work at a film studio. It was like a little indie film studio in, in San Francisco with like a couple hundred people. And I did that for a little while. And I went, and that didn't work out as well as I would have liked. Um, went to Microsoft. Now I'm 18,000 people. The, the thing, and then, Went, was there for a bunch of years and then went to a now startups were a thing left to go do a startup. Not a great time to leave and do a startup. 1999, 2000 seemed like a good idea. was not a good idea. Ended up back at Microsoft, then went to Adobe. So I started in bigger companies, but then kind of since then I've been going to not smaller and smaller. I think I found my right level. So I left Adobe, went to Spotify, but at that point, I kind of knew where I wanted, how, what I wanted to do. And I knew I was on this CTO path. And when you're doing stuff, so you're on like early stage, pre seed or uh, have they like raised the A round or B round? Like when do you like to join a startup? So C, CD round. Okay. So um, I've tried uh, early stage. So I did early stage, then didn't work out. Went back to big companies. After I Spotify, um, I'd managed about 175 people there. So I kind of knew how to run a larger organization. The kind of people that were interested in me were looking to either have either had an organization closer to that size or grow an organization to that size, which was like kind of CD scale. So I did that. Um, at one point, like I, we were talking, uh, I decided like I was maybe going to do my own kind of startup which kind of put me back talking to kind of earlier stage VCs again, which actually uh, one of my mentors had told me like, you need to be more, you know, if you want to be a CTO, you need to be more hands-on. So I'm like, okay, one of the VCs convinced me to go 
talked to this early stage company. So I went back and did early stage for a while. But I realized like this just isn't me anymore. Like this stuff is great, but you got to pay me like you got to pay me way more than you should to do the job I'm doing because the job I'm doing is not using a lot of my experience or skills because it's just a smaller team solving easy, you know, problems that are simple problems for me. I realized, you know what, actually, I kind of need to be at a bigger company. That is a better fit for me and kind of who I am at this stage and who I want to be and the kind of stuff I want to do. So that has been like, once I had that realization, I'm like, nope, this is what I do. I'm do you want to, you have a 50 person team. You want it to be a 200 person team. Uh, I'm good at that. You got a 150 person team. You want to just run well or improve how you deliver that kind of thing. Good at that. That's who, that's who I am. And that's kind of what I've done ever since. So let's suppose a developer out there, right? And of course, let's assume their economic situation where they can do whatever they want to, right? They're yeah. pretty well off, right? As far as like learning how to be a developer, learn the business, is it better to work for a big company or a startup? You know, it's funny. It's going to depend. Uh, it's going to depend a lot on what you want and who you are, right? I worked at big companies because that's what I, that that was my choices. Right? I didn't have the option of working for little companies, or it was certainly not as easy to find them as it is today. Uh, had I started at earlier stage companies, I might have been really. And and some of the folks I know that have that more come out of these that have been in startups like their whole careers, they look at like, wow, it'd be great to work for Microsoft or it'd be great to work for Google because that scene is kind of the big leagues. And for me, it's like, no, nah, it's just a different thing. But especially at as a CTO where I have a ton of influence on the business and I can help shape things, having come up through those companies, I don't want to go back and do that because I don't want to have to, you know, run thing through, run things through like six VPs to do something that everyone knows is the right thing to do. I just want to do the right thing. And so that's for me, just super uninteresting these days. How much coding do you get to do? Nowadays? Oh, wait, sorry, but I didn't answer your question. I answered a completely different question. Let me go okay, back okay, a second. Okay. So you as a developer, I think it's going to depend on kind of what you're looking for in your career. There's a lot of great things you can learn at these big companies. There's a lot of support. There's, it's a little bit of a, you fit, you know, you're on a path. You're on a path that a lot of other people are on. It's a different kind of experience, but it's a very structured, it's very understandable. A lot of other people in your boat you know, a lot of kind of safety in, in sort of being in a bigger company. So that might appeal to some people. Startups, okay, like could, could be out of a job in six months, right? But in that interim, you're going to have to do a lot more things. You're going to have a lot more flexibility. You're going to have to learn a lot faster. You're going to have to move a lot faster. You're going to have to deliver things faster. It's a little bit more often, especially as a junior developer, like you're being thrown into the deep end of the pool and you got to figure it out and there's support for you but maybe not the same amount of it, maybe a little bit different. And it depends on who you are and kind of the thing that appeals to you. Um, there's also kind of a risk reward thing, right? A small company, you know, not often, very rarely, but sometimes, you know, uh, every big company was a small company once. And if you're that person that kind of lucks into being at the right place at the right time, you can ride that, that rocket ship. Bigger company, eh, you know, it's it's again, it's like security, safety, you can earn a pretty good living, hopefully, but it's not going to be like, you know, it's a risk reward is a different thing. How how often do you get to code now? I can code as much as I want, but I don't code. I think the one of the things I learned, uh, and I, uh, I'll tell you, that I forgot it and had to relearn it recently, but um, generally. I'll tell you, because I'm running larger organizations, if I'm coding critical path stuff on the product or the platform, something went wrong, generally. That's not a good thing, because that's not my job. And that's, if I'm doing that, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? So generally, I'm still code all the, you know, every week, I'm because I still enjoy it. It's still fun for me. But I try not to be 
on the critical path or anything at the company, because if something else comes up, like we have to negotiate a contract or there's a personnel problem or some, or we got to meet with VCs or the board meeting come up and I got to work on the deck or something. That's my actual job. And if people are waiting for me to finish my thing, they're got to wait because, or I got to work, you know, a lot more hours to get it done. And I learned that lesson the hard way where I was still coding on the product, but also trying to be at the time, like a senior engineering manager and running a big team. And I was having to work more and more and more hours in the week to try and do two jobs when I should have just let go of something and, and let somebody else take it on. It was because I felt like I'd been so long. That was my job. I didn't know how to not have it be my job. So now I've learned, but occasionally like I just built a feature for us and um the the reason I gave myself why I needed to build this feature was because I wanted to show the dev development team a different way to build this kind of thing so I was actually trying to use it as a teaching tool um I'm going to build this because I because I'm trying I've been trying to convince you that we should do this in a different way so I'll do it to show you what I mean because it's harder to explain stuff to somebody than to just show them but of course and that was great and it was super fun and i love doing it and then you know we're getting ready to ship it we're shipping it any second now and like all right kevin like you got this bug you gotta go fix this bug i'm like i can't i gotta work on the board deck <laughs> i'm like well yeah but you need to fix this bug and like or we can't ship i'm like okay well i'll get to it when i get to it all right and all of a sudden it went from, oh, this is fun and I'm enjoying myself and it is fun, right? And I was enjoying myself to like, oh crap, now I'm holding everybody back because I got to go do my actual job and said this other thing that was fun. I will still, so now I think moving forward, I remind, I had to re relearn that lesson. Um, I will continue to code and I'll continue to code for the company, but I'm going to do it more as like exploratory or trying out things that maybe we want to use or exploring technologies and we might want to incorporate, which is what I mostly used to do. Do you have any side projects you're working on your own? Has nothing to do with your company? Oh, yeah. Just like fun stuff that you can Always. talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's lots of like fun projects I'll do like as a way to learn a new technology. Like there'll be something I see and I'm like, oh, that seems kind of cool. So I'll build like a one-off project for that. There's stuff I do now. Um, like my website, if you go to like kevingoldsmith.com, you can't tell because it looks like a website but I wrote my own like code uh, web page generation thing to do it because I thought it would be fun. It was like a fun project for me to work on a chance to learn some new stuff. So I'll do stuff like that. It's, and it, it tends to be like my photography website. If you go to the, uh, if you go to kevingoldsmith.com slash photo, there's one thing. If you go to photos.kevingoldsmith.com, it's a different thing. The photos.kevingoldsmith.com was an open source photo like portfolio project that these folks made and I used it cause it was easy and they stopped working on it. And so it's just, uh, it's just, I couldn't update anything anymore with it. So I'm like, okay, well I got to switch. And so I'm like, well, I'll just make my own. And so, yeah, that was like a project for a few weeks of me figuring out how to make something that kind of worked like that other thing, but from the beginning, from scratch and the need to do it just fun just to had a good time playing around with it. So you've been a CTO of several different companies, right? Yeah. Let's suppose a, a person out there, they're getting their first CTO job, we're say at a mid-sized company, right? Yeah. What advice do you have them as far as like, you know, like giving up, not coding no more, working with other business functions, like, you know, I have to assume you have to kind of mentor the CEO on different tech stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's a big role, right? It's a lot for a first time CTO. What advice do you have for people out there taking this on? You know, one, I'll say, like, if you're moving into a mid-sized company CTO role, you shouldn't be learning this. <laughs> you should know this already because you're going to, you're going to get screwed. Like it's, you can't just step into that role. The only reason I could do it at all is because I'd already learned a lot of stuff before I was CTO. Um, being a director at Adobe, where I was working like with marketing and with, uh, uh, all these different functions as part of a leadership team of a business unit. So I had at least some familiarity of that kind of stuff, being a VP at Spotify 
where same thing, like I'm working with all these different functions. Hey, I hadn't been in a senior executive team, but I was comfortable. I'd already learned I had to stop coding as part of my day job because it wasn't my day job anymore. I'd already learned all these lessons. Otherwise, if I'd showed up, so Avo is where I went to after Spotify. If I'd showed up there and I hadn't learned these lessons, I would have lasted about three months before they fired me because I would have been learned, trying to learn in a role where as CTO, no one's going to teach you anything. You're expected to know this stuff, especially at a mid-sized company. You're expected to know this stuff. And if you're learning on the job, like there, of course I did, but if you're learning from like first principles on the job, like you are not going to be effective and you will not last long. They can't afford to keep you around while you figure this stuff out because they can go and get somebody else who already knows it. Um, so it's more common, like you're maybe starting at a smaller company and the company's growing. Because a CTO, you know, as a CTO at an early stage company, as a development manager, yes, I did go meet with VCs and talk about stuff. And I helped with, you know, I helped with pitch decks and stuff. And yeah, that is different. But my day-to-day job, I was doing the same job when I was managing like eight people or like five people at, at Microsoft. That was my day job. It was like most of my work was that. It was a very different job, which is why I was saying, like, for me, I realized, like, that's not my thing. Like, the part I enjoyed was building the pitch decks, going to the VCs, pitching, and that kind of stuff. But that was a really small part of what I did. Um, So, you know, if you're a first-time CTO or you're going to be a first-time CTO, there is a lot to learn. The most important part you, I think, already mentioned, which is working as part of a cross-functional team. What I see a lot of not just CTOs, but, but even like directors or VPs where they're not necessarily in the exec team, but they're working their way to that. They focus down on their org. You're like looking down all the time. You're managing your org and maybe you're talking to a peer a little bit, but you're kind of really just running the day to day. That's not the job of a senior. That's not a job of an executive. I spend more time talking to my peers than I spend talking to any person in my organization because I need to represent technology to them and I need to take what they tell me and represent it to my team. So my team understands it. So with the exec team, I spent the exec team is in, in, in Patrick Lencioni, like he wrote a bunch of books. One of, he has this notion of first team. What's your first team? My first team is the exec team. Always. If my first team is the tech team, I'm doing the wrong job. Um, so that's one of the things you have to learn. That's one of the important skills you mentioned another, and I just lost it or yeah, not programming. Um, in a small company, yeah, you should program, but early stage CTO. Yeah. You're coding. You should be coding. If you're managing a mid-sized company as CTO and you're coding every day, you're doing the wrong job. You're not doing what you should be doing. You should be in spreadsheets, you should be in pit index. You should be in, you know, word, you should be in email. That's kind of most of the job. Does that mean you code none? No, of course you can. But if that's your primary job, you're not doing the right job. You're not doing service for your team. How does it work? Like, suppose there's someone in charge of marketing or sales and other business function. Yeah. They say, you know, we need this function now to increase sales by whatever percent. But you realize you're like, okay, this is not realistic. We don't have the team for this. Right. How do you like, you know, kind of balance that out? I've never said, I've never found a CRO that, that would agree with me on my assessment because it's always that, but now nah, it's, it's, you know, that happens all the time. That always happens. Right. And this customer says they need this thing. If we don't do it, they're not going to sign and we're going to lose a million dollars. We're going to mil- lose a million dollar deal. Your team needs to go do. This. <clears throat> so it's, that's, I've learned through experience um, more so than any other way. I hear that a lot. I hear that all the time in, in B2C or B2B companies all the time, every deal. We need this thing. If we don't do this thing, we're going to lose the deal. And I've only learned from experience of, okay, well, you, you want that. Let's figure out what it's going to take to do it. It's going to take this much. Are they willing to, it's going to cost us this much to build it. What other customers need this specific thing? Uh, nobody else, just these folks. Okay. Well, that's maybe not a good return on investment. Right. So it's kind of reasoning it out with them, but you know, a salesperson, 
their commission, right? This is a big deal. And they probably spent months kind of working to get to this point. So they're never going to want to hear, sorry, this is not important enough, or we're not going to do this thing that you want to do. But, you know, it's always then figuring out, okay, well, you know, we can't do, this doesn't make sense. So the, However, the salesperson here, Kevin's taking money. I'm out. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. Out yeah. Right. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, the, I was going to buy that boat. <laughs> I can't buy that boat. now. But that's also where you also learn again, like working cross-functionally, I'm going to go sit in on the next sales call with you. So there's, you know, they're talking to the CTO. I'm going to talk to him about this. Maybe we can figure out something else that's not going to be as expensive, or maybe I can actually realize like, oh, they don't, they don't really need this but I can talk to them about it and they'll get it. Or maybe they're going to convince me and I'll go, you know what? No one else needs this thing specifically, but this thing generally, yeah, maybe that does make sense. Let me figure out when we can get it to you by. Maybe we can sign the contract today where we can get it to you, you know, Q3 next year or whatever. So next, Kevin, you talk about the importance of design. I think a lot of startups, they're built stuff with no design at all, no designer. Yeah. Talk about the importance of design, you know, like how you implement that into your, your building, building process. It's t design's always tough because I love, um, you know, for me, I, I love kind of lean style product development where you're like super fast iterating in, in the market. And that requires a team that's kind of all working together kind of constantly. Design is a function that kind of needs its own time. And because you're not designing each feature in, in, uh, in a box, like it's got to be part of a bigger thing. The design has to always figure out how it's incorporating into a larger kind of idea. So a lot of times design ends up being this kind of bottleneck for feature development. Um, if the company's never had it, integrating it is usually pretty painful because all of a sudden you got somebody that's looking at everything you did. And I've been in that experience, right? They're looking at everything you did and going, this sucks. Like this is really bad. We got to fix everything. Um, but you know, once they start working and you start seeing things improve or you can usually, hopefully you got metrics so you can see how you can usually measure if you're going from no design to some design, you can usually see that reflected in product metrics pretty quickly because usually like you have horrible information architecture, you have horrible UX, like, and people start like having an easier time to, to do it. And then that'll get you know, that'll help design kind of get a foothold in, but then it's all about figuring out how design becomes integrated into the process and not a separate thing. We're going to go spend two months designing this huge thing, deliver it to you. And now you got to build it. I know nope, what's working. We're all working together and we're working in a real iterative way. It's a little bit painful, a little bit hard to get to, but if it's working, it's perfect. So, in the world of tech, are developers and designers like the same level or developers are kind of over designers or like, is that a... Depends on which company you're in. Okay. But generally, uh, the companies I've worked in, it's the same level, right? Okay. So okay. when I was a engineering manager, like just managing a team, I had a product peer and I had a design peer. When I was a director, I had a design peer and a product peer. And sometimes you hear called the trio... Some companies call it trio, some companies call it the three amigos, whatever. Um, that's that kind of pairing, those three disciplines working together it, as peers uh, can work really, really well if you're each kind of representing and you're working as a, as a unit, first team. Um, some companies know like it works in a really different way or designs a whole separate department or, you know, some companies now it's becoming a little bit more common, like, everybody reports to a product manager or everybody reports to an engineering manager, including product. And depending on which company it depends on how it's, how it's set up. Do developers tend to think one way and designers can think another way? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's a, I mean, doesn't mean developers can't be visually oriented. Doesn't mean designers can't be like thinking code or anything like that, but um, they're different disciplines, right? It, it's, can't do the catcher and the pitcher think the same way. No, they kind of see the world through, through their perspective. Right. You had like developer doing one thing, designer doing one thing and you have like the marketing come, we need this done for SEO and backlinks and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like what? Yeah, that happens. Yeah, totally happens. Yeah. Marketing comes in like this doesn't like 
this is part of my life. This has been a part of my life for a long time. Yeah. What are we doing? Like we got to go fix this thing or fix that thing. And then how does a product manager play a role in all this? Again, it's, it's going to be specific to like different companies. My general experience is like the product manager, you, you in this, like think of this trio, right? Uh, or even just the product manager and engineering manager relationship, which is a little bit more close because a lot of times designers are supporting multiple teams. The product manager is going to be the what, and the engineering manager is going to be the how, right? And that doesn't mean like they can't do each other's jobs or work really closely together, but usually product manager is getting input from marketing, they're getting input from engineering, they're getting input from sales, they're, they're talking to customers and they're saying, you know what? what we need to do next, we need to do this thing next. And all right, I'm going to let's, this is the next thing we need to do. And then the engineering manager's job is to say, okay, let's figure out how we're going to do it and how quickly we can get it to you. And what are the stages to get from here to there? You ready for another drink? You're still good. I'm still good. So how does someone convince you to work for them? Is it like, Compensation package, the mission, like how does someone like, you know, like back for a better term, steal you from your current position or like previous jobs you had, like they come recruit you or like, yeah. how do they convince you, hey, like, I know you work for this great company now, but this is going to be even better for you. It, it's, it's funny. Um, was it? Yeah, no, I, I actually, so I have a, I have a podcast um, and last week's episode was this was it's called taking a deliberate approach to the job search process and it is literally how i think about like what's the next job i'm going to take and um what i'll say is um it's never for me it's almost never it's not 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 going to be a package it's not going to be like the the number one way a recruiter can turn me off is going to be to tell me about how much money i'm going to make at a job because that to me is usually like this is going to be a nightmare but there's a chance it's always, it's never for sure. It's always, there's a chance that at the end of it, you could make a lot of money. If you got to sell me on how much I'm going to get paid, it probably means I'm, it's not going to be something. But what I'll tell you is there's a few things I look for. And um, one is going to be culture, culture of the company. I, I, I've been in enough different companies now where I know this is the kind of place I want to work. And this is the kind of place I don't want to work at. And so talk to them, talk, to, how did the stuff work at the company? How did they do things? If it seems like, okay, this is, and by the way, it, that's a personal thing, right? What appeals to me is not going to appeal to anybody else. Like these are the things over the years I've decided like are important to me. Autonomy is one, like there's a lot of things, but autonomy, uh, pragmatism, those, these kind of things, super important. So you come to me with that great start. Um, then it's going to be, you know, is this a product I'm excited about is there's a lot of different things that come into it. My current role. So I was, I had a great job CTO at Anaconda data science company, huge. I was excited to work on open source. There's a huge, like 30 million people use their stuff. Excited to work on, on lots of different parts of it. Love the exec team, love the company culture. It was great. But um, I was super excited. At, I'd been doing B2B companies. So I had been a string of B2B companies. Now, and they wanted to really do, they, like I said, they had a huge open source thing. They had a B2B business as well. And they were interested in kind of building a bigger B2C business. I was excited about that. And I'm like, this is great. I'm super excited about it. Been a couple of years at the company. The, tr the challenges, uh, like they kind of got a little bit into innovators dilemma couldn't got, we just kept digging deeper and deeper, building a bigger and bigger B2B business. B2C business was struggling because just wasn't getting the investment. I was the only one that was really, there was interest in it, but I was the only one that was really, I felt championing it and excited about it because there was such a, this huge B2B opportunity. So it's starting to get a bit frustrated. I probably would have kept going, but then this other company, my current company, DistroKid called me back in music. I love, you know, I'm a musician. Spotify I love, background musician. And and the chief product officer I worked with at Spotify, super respected him, really, you know, really liked him. 
I knew because he and I had worked together. I knew that he wasn't going to go someplace. I wasn't going to want to go. I knew a few other people at the company that and met the founder, loved the founder, super respected the founder. And it was just, yep, yeah, no, this makes sense to me. And then we figured out the package that, that was going to work for me. Right. Has there been a time in the past when like a country, a company kind of fooled you? Like they didn't lie to you. I mean, just tell the whole truth. And you guys are like, yeah, okay, this no, was not expecting. And yeah, how, do you, right. how do you handle that? But, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, no, that happens. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be so cruel or I'm not going to be so mean about it. Like I think, and I absolutely had this, I've absolutely had this experience multiple times. I, I will say this multiple times where once it was, no, the, 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 the company wanted to be the company I wanted to work at. Like that was the sort of, that was the goal. That was the desire. And so somebody like me at the company was going to be great. They were excited to do what I wanted to do. It, it seemed perfect. When it came, when things got tough, they became who they really were. Right. And, and who they really were, wasn't that company. Right. So it's kind of like your aspirations versus reality. Right. So they aspired to be one thing, but when the true nature came out, but the true nature started coming out and I started realizing like, it wasn't that they didn't, it wasn't that they like uh bait and switched me. No, it was, no, this is who they thought they were, but really this is who they are. And all of a sudden, like the people who I really respected and really liked working with were starting to leave because you leave or be pushed out. And I'm like, okay, well, this is clearly not what I expected it was going to be. And I, I need to move on because I know I'm not going to be happy here because I'm now seeing who they really are. But it took, you know, it took a little while to get to that point. There's another time, uh, another company where, you know, I, maybe I could have figured this out. I don't know how I missed it, but I met the exact, you know, when you interview for a job like CTO, especially at a mid-sized company, you interview with the exec team, you interview with some of the development team, you interview with some of the investors, you interview with a bunch of people. I loved everybody I interviewed with. I didn't really get a lot of time with the CEO, but you know, okay. There were two founders of the company that were kind of peers in the exec team. And what I realized after I got there, they had really different ideas about the company they were building. And so the founder that hired me was excited, like, he, me, the chief product officer, chief people officer, like we were kind of one kind of people. Um, that was the, what company he was trying to build. CEO hired the CRO and the CFO, and they were great people, different kinds of people. And in the time I was at that company, it became like there was essentially a civil war between two halves of the exec team trying to pull the company in two very different ways. And eventually like, it, it, and by the way, like I'll tell you, almost every time something like that happens, the end result is the entire exec team flips because eventually the investors go, "What the heck is going on? Like, you're this is just not working." And then, and so that's a completely different exec team. They're all gone. All everybody got cleared out. I left. Everybody else got cleared out. Yeah, I know a lot of people disagree with this. Like in the HR, they say hire slow. I don't believe in hiring slow. Like. Don't be wrong. You should meet someone to hire them the next day, right? But like, yeah. my thing is in the process, you're saying you're the best candidate possible. Maybe that could be true. Maybe it's not. The company seems the best company ever. Only way to know if it's going to work out is to go work for the company. I think, right? Yeah. No. And yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. That is a hundred percent right. I, you know, when these things haven't worked out, like, I spend some time like thinking about. All right, what, what, what could I have seen? What could I have done differently to have seen this, anticipated this? And the answer is like, I mean, I'm sure you, you never know. You ask you your questions. Know, you know. You they, ask your question. They answer the question in a, in, a, in a light to like entice you to come, come on the company. You know, yeah, yeah. what's funny to me now, actually, uh, what's funny to me sometimes is, um, I've gotten way better, better, not my questions, but the questions they ask me. Cause oftentimes those would be really revealing. Um, and you'll hear like, okay, well, what do you think about this? It's like, um, I don't, you know, it's not a common, like, wh what do you think about, like, what do you look for when you hire developers or whatever? It's like, what do you think about this thing? And I'll be like, uh, I don't know, like, <laughs> is that a problem? And usually I'll hear like, why are you asking me this? Yeah. Well, 
is this a problem in the company? And it'll be usually like, well, you know, it's a thing we, we deal with sometimes. And it's, okay, this is like a really big problem you have. And you're just trying to figure out how I'd handle it. I don't know. It's, it's a, you're absolutely right. You got to go work for the company. And it's funny because, um, you know, different companies have different things. Like I've, I've been hired as CTO or gotten an offer as CTO with like four hours of interviews, which is stupid. Like it's not enough time. And then there's other jobs where it's like, no, you like, I think when I interviewed at Spotify and again, like I was interviewing from Seattle for a job in Sweden, which meant like I was doing video interviews at like five in the morning sometimes, but they interviewed me for 20 hours before they flew me. And then they booked me for two solid days from like 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then dinner. And I, I interviewed 40 something hours yep. for that job. That was a CTO role? No, that was a director, director role. Okay. I started as a director there. And, but, you know, I knew I, in the end, I, well, I got the job. Yeah. If I hadn't gotten the job, I wouldn't. Do something. <laughs> but at the end, like, I felt like I knew everything. And they knew me. They were really hiring slow. But I will say that's maybe one company, Adobe's maybe another, where they also interview me for two days, um, where like the writing on the box was right. Yeah. Like what I saw was what I got. But the challenge is when you go through all that for like a entry level role or internship, right? You know, that's what all the complaints come on. I I read something I read something in one of the, in a tech recruiting blog last week or something and they were talking about uh sort of millennials approaches to interviewing or how to hire millennials I, I, I don't remember but they talked about like interviews being too long like that's a real like that's a real problem and what they quoted was something like like some they quoted somebody saying like they wanted me to interview for like four hours and like yeah like come on like when am i when I interviewed for my first job, uh, where they didn't know me, but like, so I did an internship at Silicon Graphics. It was a company I went to after college and then they hired me. So they, you know, so it wasn't as big a deal to hire an intern. So that wasn't a huge, yeah, I interviewed for a few hours, but then they knew me, then they hired me. And then when I went to go work for that film studio, we'd been working on a project with them. So I'd spend a bunch of time there. They knew me. They, okay. It wasn't a cold interview. When I went to Microsoft, it was a cold interview. They reached out in you know, brought me up, interviewed me. They didn't know me at all. Two days of, of interview, like two full, full, full days with dinner with somebody in between. And, um, I have no idea where I'm going with this story. <laughs> Why bring, wait, we, oh, okay, okay. But that was fine. We were talking about four hours being too long. Yeah. Right. So it was a super long interview. Um, it was stressful. Certainly. Could they have done it shorter? Definitely. But that was what you did. Like, no, two days of interviews. It's what you do to, that's how you interview for your job. I never had anything less than like two full days. And these are old school interviews and I know writing people, on a white, answering problems on a whiteboard where somebody stares at the back of your head. People get like compensated for this stuff or is this part of the process? No, okay. no it's just part of the process. So, you know, there's a part of me like being kind of like old man shouting at clouds where I'm like, come on, like four hours is too long for you to like, we got to You got to know us and we got to know you. But what and if this four hours has enough. like five interviews, four hours a piece, 20 hours, pick, decide which companies you want to interview with. I, so, you know, I understand, like, we don't make people interview for two days. Like, we don't do that because same thing. Like, that's not, don't have that. People don't want to do it. People aren't going to sit through it. Okay, got it. But, you know, to complain, like, they made me interview for four hours yeah. before they paid me six figures. I mean, yeah, there's, that part, there's that part too, yeah, that they yeah. leave out, yeah. So what, what's your take on whiteboard interviews? I know a lot of developers would, like, complain about them. You know, like, yeah. this, this is not realistic. If I was doing the job, I'd be... Googling and stuff or chat GPT or yeah. open resource. So I'd be shocked if anybody still does it. Maybe okay. somebody still does it, but no, I mean, that was, was an archaic thing, thing in the past. That was archaic. Okay. It was stupid. And okay. you're absolutely right. It had nothing so to do with the job. What I'm hearing you saying is if a developer is out there and you need for a job and they say, you're going to do a four hour whiteboard, they should run away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But, but there, there are, 
other ways to kind of assess your skill or knowledge that are more interactive, like bring your own computer. Here's a problem. You're going to use your own code editor. You can Google because we do, of course. Like, I just want to see, you know, and maybe we'll work on it together. Or sometimes, you know, sometimes people do, you know, we're going to send you this problem at home. Answer it. Give us the answer. Don't spend more than this long on it. Some companies will even pay you. If you finish this, we'll pay you this amount of money to cover your time, which I think is awesome. So there's some other ways to assess that now that are more realistic and closer to the actual job. Well, yeah. There's a developer working through now. What would a developer have to do to like, kind of impress you, right? Like, do they have like what extra, like, they have to like, you know, tell to a certain, you know, certain language, like do something faster, like present your problem and then provide you a solution. Like, what does a developer do like to impress you at your level? I'll tell you this because I've told, I've been very open and public about this specific thing. Um, for the longest time. So one of the things I learned at Microsoft, right? There was questions Microsoft would ask programming problems, but everyone knew them because there was a, it's not that Microsoft made you use these, but everyone knew them. So we all did learn them. So that was the questions. And eventually I realized like every candidate I knew, every candidate I met knew the answers and they knew them because they knew this was a question we asked and they knew they looked them up and came prepared. So I had to invent my own question. So I invented a question that was super simple because I think I ended up doing it on fly. Like I asked them one of the standard questions. They solved it too fast. I'm like, you, you knew this. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. So I kind of invented my own question and I came up with a really simple problem and they solved it, which was great. Right. And they solved it. Okay. I said, okay, well, let's make it more complicated. Okay. Let's make it more complicated. Okay. Let's make it more complicated. And kept solving it, kept improving it. And eventually I got to, okay, let's do this now. And I realized kind of looking at what they'd done, the smartest thing for them to do at that point was throw away what they'd done and start something new because it would have been much simpler. Like they could have come up with a very simple solution. And this candidate struggled, really struggled because he kept trying to figure out, okay, maybe if I do this or change this and kept, he had this thing in front of him and he couldn't let go of it. Even though he'd spent like 20 minutes, it's not like months and months. Right. And this is where that pragmatism comes in. Because what he, the smartest thing for him to done would have been to look at it and go, this is, all right, this is going to be too hard to use whatever I've done. I need to start over and it'll be way easier and just couldn't let go. So that became then like the standard question I would ask. And I would ask it of junior developers and I would ask it of super senior developers. And over time I saw all these different answers to it. I was the only one asking it. So it wasn't like people came in knowing it. But what I started to realize was like, it was this, it was a question a junior developer could answer and they would answer it in maybe a naive or simple way. A senior developer would answer it in a better way, a very senior developer answer it in a better way. But then I would do this thing. I just keep complicating it just piece by piece, not making it much harder, but to a, to the point where it, and you'd keep solving it. Like, nope, that works great. Let's, what if now I won't care about this until they got to that point where they needed to throw out their answer and the best programmers, junior, mid-level or senior, would look at their stuff, think about it for a minute and go, yeah, this is too complicated. I think if we start over, we can do it much faster and they would do that. And that was the thing I was usually looking for. But even if you didn't have that, usually you'd kind of see like, how do they think? How do they refactor? That kind of stuff. So you kind of already answered this question with your, with your last answer, but what does a developer have to do or not do for you? We're like, okay, we might have made a mistake with this hire. We might, we might want to look at maybe getting rid of this person. Uh, it's going to be different things for different people. Sometimes you got brilliant people um, who are really good at what they do, but can't work in a team. The we used to be programming used to be a solitary activity. Like I would go into my office I would, or my cubicle, but I'd go into my office. I'd close the door. You wouldn't see me for four hours. Right. And I would come out and give you something. Right. Or go sit in my cubicle with my headphones on and not talk to anybody for days at a time. That's not how we work anymore. We work in teams. Software has become so much more complicated. You can't do it by yourself. You got to work in a team. Certainly if you're building a real product. So you can be brilliant, but if you can't work in a team can't you know, can't use you. And usually it becomes apparent over time. And sometimes it's, 
you're just not good at working in teams sometimes kind of a jerk that happens or whatever so can those be can those people be coached to be you always try or? you always start with coaching but um you start with coaching if you know it, the you start with coaching some people i've seen adjust right go realize oh okay i understand like if they have the self-awareness and not and the not ego but you know to realize okay what i'm doing is not helping i need to think about what i'm doing and maybe figure out a new way even if it takes them a while to do it but if you see progress usually you will continue to invest and sometimes people are like nope i'm i'm awesome like everybody else is the problem <laughs> and then it's, it becomes an easy decision yeah so many people like that unfortunately right oh yeah oh yeah yeah too many so sometimes that sometimes it's like oh they just don't have the skills you know, we thought they had the skills. They're not really demonstrating the skills. Same thing. You always start with coaching. Hey, can we help you get more useful? There's a point where, you know, um, I don't have many engineers reporting directly to me, right? I have very, very senior people as engineers reporting to me and everybody else reports to somebody that reports to somebody that reports to me. But the, what I, when I'm talking to them and they're telling me for the, you know, fifth, one-on-one -on -one in a row that they're really struggling with this person or this person is, you know, having a hard time or is not getting their work done and they've been working with them. I'll have this conversation with them. Like any person on any person on your team, they're either helping the team or they're hurting the team. Like there's a scale, like imagine these scales. And if the scales are out of balance where they're hurting the team more than they're helping, Okay, you can live with that for a while. You can try and like the new hire, right? Yeah, or new hire, or sometimes even new somebody role. senior and or new role, or you know, something's going on or whatever, you know. But there'll be a point where you have to make that decision of no matter how much we invest in this person, they're taking away more than they're adding. And that's when you have to say, like, somebody else, we could bring in somebody else to do this job and they they might add. I think that's what a lot of uh, people get wrong nowadays. That's my opinion, right? I think a lot of people are like most businesses are not nonprofits, right? Like, yeah, if you're if a company's going to pay you a hundred thousand dollars, it's not as good as a heart because they're paying a hundred thousand dollars. They expect you to bring like two, three hundred thousand dollars in value to the company, right? Yeah. And so many people have this like attitude. Like, I, I'm a big believer. Like, I'm just making this up. Twenty percent of the world, they're like, okay, I'm getting paid a hundred thousand. I need to prove I'm worth this, right? I need to yeah. prove I'm worth this. Where yeah. eighty percent, like I'm only getting paid a thousand dollars. I'm only going to do this, right? And then the twenty percent, they get promotions, more pay. Other eighty percent, they, they stagnate. You know, yeah. This, this is my opinion. I think I, it, it absolutely happens. I think you know you're you're good at your job. You get told you're good at your job. You get paid well. You get told that over and over and over again. Like so, if you know, again, eventually you can get to your head. I think, you know, or you're told like, you know, your conceptions about what the job should be are, are just wrong, right? You're right. Like if we're paying you a hundred grand and you're making less and you're bringing in less than a hundred grand, the company goes out of business yeah. and we're all out of a job. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's obvious with like salespeople with quota, it's not obvious with developers, like how much are you bringing in? It's pretty hard to tell. But again, it's this notion of, is the team delivering less because you're on it than if we had no one in your slot or anybody else in your slot? And it's really coming to that decision. And honestly, you know, um, uh, shoot, I just forgot her name. Um, she was a uh, chief people officer at Netflix, Patty McCord. Uh, Patty McCord. I saw her give a talk once and changed my life before she did her book. Um, because one thing she talked about was this, the, the idea that um, PIPs like performance improvement plans don't work. Yeah, they don't, no. No, they don't. But I, but to that point, I'd, I'd had to do them, right, as part of big companies. And, but I'd never seen them succeed. So it was really just a formality of this process of we give advance notice you you are gone for you're going to fire you so there's nothing right. you can do to fix this but her point was not just that okay they don't work and so you shouldn't do them but her point was it's actually mean yeah right because now you got somebody who's like who's just not right for the job and here you are every day telling them 
you're still not good enough and we're going to have to fire you. And you're then still how many people enough. know that, you know? Yeah. It, it's just mean to people. They it, say it's on a pip now. Well, you wouldn't know. And yeah, but, but the, but the thing of it is like, um, but that kind of changed the way I think about it because you're, she is absolutely right. Like I have, I have to say, I've still, I've since seen people recover from pips and do well, but it is so rare. It is so yeah. unusual. And so that's kind of where I've gotten to the, this idea of like, you know, you're, we're going to give you lots of chances. It's not like oh, you, you should put one foot wrong. We're firing you. But there's a point where it's like, you're not doing well and it's obvious and we're trying to help you and it's, you're just in the wrong job. Yeah. There's a better opportunity for you, you somewhere else. Yeah. You could be, you could go some other place and be amazingly successful. Whatever it is you in this team or you in this company just isn't working. And the longer we let you kind of suffer, really, yeah. it's just mean at a certain point. So, you know, so we try and help, but at a certain point it's, it really is like, this isn't working. We got to just move on. And it's just a question of like how, you know, I've never, you know, you always default to letting it go too long, Yeah. but almost every time you make the decision, it happens and everyone goes, all right, th well, thank you. Cause we, we like, you know, we really like this person, but it's pretty obvious. Like they're holding the, like they, we're waiting on them. Almost. I'm just like, they say hire slow. Everyone says fire fast. Yeah. No one fires fast, right? No one fires it's, fast. It's, it's your birthday. It's the holidays. It's this, it's that, you know. He's just or, a nice guy. you just don't want to be mean. Yeah. Right? It's it's kind of, you don't want to be a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. So people listening, so Patty McCord at Netflix, does a they did a thing, the Netflix culture week, right? Yeah. I highly recommend, what, oh, yeah. startup, what are size company you have? Like you're trying to do culture. It, it, it's a pretty long slide deck. I think like over 100 pages, like 100 slides, but man. Yeah. Like. If you're starting a company, whatever, man, read that Netflix culture brief. It is, it is, it is fucking outstanding, right? It's like, it is, it is like, it's, it's like the standard, I think, right? To go off of. The oh, yeah. Opinion, right? It's just so, it's just so great. The genius of it, I mean, the genius of it wasn't, and, and the genius, and I, again, I, I didn't, I read it when it came out. Yeah, so huge. The genius of it wasn't what they said in the deck. What they said in the deck made total sense for who Netflix is, right? It wasn't like you should be Netflix, but what, but a lot of people thought like, oh, we need to do what Netflix does, right? The genius of it was we're going to tell everybody in the world, this is what we do. So you read that culture deck and I read the deck and I'm like, I don't know if I want to work there. Mm -hmm. Did its job, you're right? right. It did. Or you yeah, read the right. deck and you go, that looks awesome. I can't wait to work there boom, did its job, right? You knew what you were getting into. And if you showed up at Netflix and they're like, we're doing this now. And you're like, wait a second, that's not what I <laughs> yeah. want. It's like, we told you what we yeah. do. Right? The thing about the Netflix deck is like, you know, we're not a family, right? All the business yeah. we're a family, we're not a family. We're like a sports team, you know, yeah. like last year you hit like, you know, scored average 30 points a game in an NBA game. Yeah. Now you're averaging five, five points, you're gone, right? Yeah. And they were super upfront with it. It's like, when this and you know, the amazing thing is eventually they came for patty right they did yeah yeah it's like hey patty and she's like okay uh, you know yeah she's like can't can't argue with that this is what we do i've been telling people for years yeah. this is what we do i guess it's my time you know? yeah but yeah that's like i think that's a good standard if you want to do a culture brief or build culture i think yeah. that's a good standard to go off of right of course like you said each company can be different oh stuff, yeah but you know? just the way the the forthrightness and 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 transparency and the fact they put and it out and the fact they put, they it, put out. it out everywhere. absolutely I'm also a big fan of Buffer, right? Like Buffer yeah. puts out all the stuff, is right? Great that way. Like they they put out. Now I don't know if I agree with them putting out like the pay and all that kind of stuff, you know, and like you know equity and stuff. I yeah. don't know about that far, you know, maybe not, but like all the stuff, yeah. It's interesting. Again, Buffer, you know, when Buffer started doing this, I got really super interested because again, like you got to appreciate like being on Front Street. Like this is who we are. This is how we do it. We're gonna. You come here. You know, can't tell us we didn't tell you because yeah. this is what we do and i really did appreciate that the pay thing i felt weird about and but and honestly like again like i looked at the buffer i at this point i was i was too senior like i was not gonna go work there because they didn't my job wasn't gonna be available <laughs> but um but i looked at it, i'm like would i want to go work there i'm like no i don't you know looking at this no nope, i don't think i want to work there but i really appreciate it. like i can make that decision because they've told me everything 
And there's a lot of cool stuff they do that I can learn from. Yeah. Even if that's not, even if I'm not going to go work there, which I also appreciated. The pay thing is interesting because it's becoming a bigger thing these days. Yeah. Like, of course, they were it, one of the early ones. Yeah. There's of course, a, they're pulling yeah. so they can pay, but make, to make it public like that. Yeah. Know. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's like, you know, I'm Jason Cadmus. I'm, you know, head of, you know, marketing at Buffer. I'm making this money and it's out there, right? Yeah. I don't know uh, if I agree with that. I, I never, like, I felt weird about it. I still feel weird about it. I know some people really, really like it. Again, like yeah, I, yeah, I like exactly. the idea of it's a choice. Can you imagine like you work at Buffer? I'm head of marketing making 150000 Yeah. And like my, like some friend were, hey, you got a money? Come loan me some money or do this or that, you know, sure. like, you know. Sure. But I mean, like, but yeah, again, transparent. again, it's a, ch it's a choice. Yeah. Like, do I want to work in a company where they're, everyone they're, knows how much money I make? They're like transparent with the capital T. Yeah. You and that. some people care a lot about it. And I, I'm like, yeah, go there. Like, go do that. And, and again, it's, you don't, you, you have salary out there. Don't go for a buffer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I like that, you know, is that something I want? No, no, but no. do I appreciate it? No. And if I was a different person, maybe I'd be like, yeah, this is exactly yeah, what that's, I want. That's too much. Person, that's too much transparency. But people, you know, it's, I'm telling you, Buffer is pretty, still pretty successful, successful, right? Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's not a huge company too, right? Like would that scale, scale, like Atlassian is another company where they're actually very open. Um, I don't know how, how much underneath they're a much bigger company. I don't know how much underneath like their culture stuff. They're very front about their culture stuff and their salaries. I don't know how much of that translates underneath. Like if you actually are working there, I've heard different yeah. things from different friends that work there, but they're at least very, they're super pay transparency, super culture transparency. It's a bigger company. I think if Buffer was 500 people or a thousand people, I think they'd start to struggle with some of these things. Yeah. Like, um, because I think that would start to create problems. It's hard to maintain that tight culture as you grow, you start to bring in people who are like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to make that salary. I want to make this salary. This is how much I get paid. And they're like, well, we really need this person to solve this problem. So maybe this person we can make an exception on or something. So this next question may be easy or maybe hard for you, right? But of all the stuff you built personally, all the stuff you always saw being built, mm -hmm. what's the one thing you're most proud of? Dang. It's always the thing I'm, I'm doing now. Now I'll be, I'll be the political, I'll give you the political answer. I'll give you a non-political answer. I think, you know, I, I love district kid. So, so thing I'm working on, I love it. I'm super excited about it. It changed the way I think about how I make music and how I release music. And I very much appreciate that. So sure. District kid's awesome. If there's other things I'm also extremely proud of, I'm super proud of what we did at Spotify. Um, so Cause, you, know, cause you, you, I could be wrong, but your team and you built the current Spotify platform, right? Well, it's, I've been gone eight years, almost eight years now. So no, okay. like they, 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 if I, if I had, that would be really scary. Cause that means like okay. they've, well, back in the day you built. The yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I was responsible for what well, I was VP of engineering for consumer at Spotify, which meant that I was responsible for the mobile apps, the desktop apps, the web apps, all the ingestion and storage and streaming stuff. So, so what you think of basically as a Spotify product, like the thing you use. And as part of that, like we built all this cool stuff. So we built podcasts, we built video on the product. We built a lot of like your collection, save this artist. Um, the larger team built uh, the, all the AI kind of recommendation filled features. That was part of the larger group. It wasn't something that I was directly responsible for, but I worked really closely with that. That is what made Spotify go from like, I think it was like what, 10, 15 million users when I joined to a hundred something. Um, so hugely proud of that. And I, I still see every day I use a product every day. I still see things in that product that like my team built and maybe, eh, maybe it's changed, maybe it's slightly different, but I can look at many, many things in that product and go, yep. I remember when we did this, I remember how it evolved to this point. This is awesome. So, because I use the product every day, there's stuff I worked on at Adobe. The thing I was kind of most product proud of at Adobe um, was this product we built from scratch, which was like a consumer photography product. 
and it was awesome. And it was just, and I think it had the right product market fit, but it was just Adobe, just the wrong company at that time, even with all its kind of photography chops was just not the right company to bring it to market. Most of it lives on because some of that team ended up at Google Photos. So a lot of that, a lot of those ideas end up in Google Photos and they've evolved it since then. It's kind of similar to, to Google Photos, but I'm really proud of that. Not only because of, it was a cool product. It deserved to be bigger. It, we had maybe 6 million users, right? It deserved to be bigger, but also we built it from when I joined the team, it was a small group of folks work on this prototype and we shipped it in six months while growing the team like 5X. And it went from concept to product launch in six months and then grew steadily over the next year. And that for Adobe, when I joined that team, they were still very much in this kind of creative suite mindset one and a half, one to one and a half to two years between product releases, we were releasing a new version every six weeks. That's, that's a big difference, right? It was huge. Yeah, a it was year a and huge a few difference. Six months, man, just, man. From, from nothing to six months and then updating new versions every six months. And were these people working the same amount of hours each week? You just like improved the... That was the other part that to me, honestly, like I fully expected, like me and the product manager, we one of the things Adobe is not great at, and maybe it's changed. It's been a while since I worked there, but eh, I don't think so. Um, it was not great at incubating new products. It buys products, right? It buys other companies and integrates their products. There are home built, home grown products at Adobe. But if you think of the vast majority of them, including Photoshop, not invented at Adobe, purchased by Adobe and then grown. This was homegrown, but what I'd seen happen, having been at the company a bunch of years, they would, they liked the idea. Like, well, they wanted to build new products. The problem was these new products could never reach escape velocity. They would get killed before they launched because it either, you know, there was, you know, there was fear about it or whatever. So these products kept getting killed. So I knew we had to ship quickly. That was the only way we were going to get out because if we spent a year, we would never make it. So I wanted a really aggressive date. Me and the product manager looked at the schedule of events, like what event could we do, launch at. And we found one. It was March. We found one in September. All right, we're launching in September. And the so I was assuming, okay, like there's a lot, obviously a ton of work to do between now and then. And I expected it'd been a while since I'd worked for startups, but you know, I was expecting, okay, like we're going to be working late nights, weekends, whatever to get there. But let's see if we can do it without, like, I won't do that because I've death marched what they call death marching at Microsoft where we worked six or seven days a week for a year at a time. And I knew what that did to people. So I'm like, all right, we're, we're not going to do that till we have to do it, but I know we're going to have to do it at some point. And because we were really careful, we like I said, we were very lean, very agile, didn't commit to a set of things, didn't design the entire thing up front and then have to build it. We built piece by piece by piece by piece. And we didn't, we worked one weekend. The last weekend before the launch, we ended up working that weekend and that was it. And then, but it was nine to five, maybe, you know, maybe 10, yeah, yeah, yeah. nine to seven yeah. or nine to six, but it wasn't like 12 hour days, six days a week. It was, you know, 10 hour, eight to 10 hour days, five days a week for six months. And then one weekend to just make sure it was all locked up and ready for the launch. Boom. And that was it. And then after that, now we're just updating, you know, just crank, turning the crank every, every couple of weeks, just new features, new features, new features. So follow up question, is there something out there that like, like, it was successful? You're like, now you're like, man, if I'd have done something differently or did something like this, it would have been a whole lot better. Um, maybe that product, honestly. Um, there was, uh, there were other products I worked on that are long gone that I wish, you know, had been, I thought had a lot more potential. I wish they did, but I wasn't necessarily in a position to fix them. 
I think this product is called Adobe Rebel. This product is that one where I knew in my heart that this could be a really successful product. And towards the end of my time at Adobe, what was starting to happen was we were successful, right? Like I said, we had 6 million customers. And at what I didn't realize is what I expected to happen would be, we got 6 million customers in a year you leave us alone because obviously we're doing something right. <laughs> but what I didn't realize is like, oh, okay, what ha and ended up happening instead is like everybody wanted a piece of us. Like, cool, this needs to work now with Photoshop Elements. This now needs to do this. This now needs to do this. You built on AWS, you need to move everything to work in the Adobe data centers. All this kind of stuff. I'm like, we don't no, like this is a horrible, and I started moving into this thing where I was just defending and kind of holding back the tide, but sort of everybody wanted to kind of incorporate what we were doing into what they were doing or capitalize on the success. And I eventually just got tired of it. It was somewhere in there, Spotify contacted me and that's when I left to go to Spotify. But I wonder, you know, if I had done things differently or played the politics differently if I could have, you know, and I was certainly part of a leadership group, but it wasn't all me, but I was certainly in a position where maybe I could have influenced it in the right way to have saved that product. Cause I still think that product was awesome and was really cool. And I regret, I, I, I used it after I left. I used it till it went away. It was a great product. So obviously you're biased. And yeah. you have them for eight years. Yeah, but yeah. Is there a really difference between Spotify and Apple? Spotify and Apple Music? Oh, yeah. You mean the products or the company? Products, yeah, product, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they're different. I think the, you know, there's, they have the same libraries, right? Basically, like, well, like, exactly, more or less. Like, you have to choose not to be on Apple Music or not to be on Spotify, but basically, same product. Uh, Apple's change, Apple Music's changed a lot since their launch, right? So the big difference between Spotify and Apple Music when Apple Music launched was Spotify had an you know had an editorial component, and that was one of the things that we built up while I was there is much stronger editorial team. But it was it had this algorithmic component, and we made a huge benefit of that. Understanding what you like, trying to get the right music, that the music you like, and helping you discover new music you might not know but you might like keeping the keeping you in in sort of your zone or in your mood and you know the latest features like dj or some of these other things that they've launched recently daylist that kind of stuff is all about this idea apple music started from kind of the opposite and if you look at how they started especially because spotify started not with music industry people leading it it was like these former pirates and computer people that liked music Apple Music started with like music industry heavyweights. And they came at it from this place of like, if you look at the launch, it's like, we know what music you should like. We brought in these head of BBC music to program stuff. We're going to give you, it was an editorial first approach. Apple Music has moved more steadily towards algorithmic. Spotify kind of moved more towards um, a mix of editorial and algorithmic. But I think that those kind of pieces still are at its heart. I think the iTunes kind of legacy still in that kind of mentality still holds back um, Apple Music a bit. Um, but, you know, it's still a successful product. It's got tons of people using it. It should have killed Spotify. It absolutely should have killed Spotify. <laughs> and we were, I was at, I was at Spotify <laughs> when Apple Music was launching. Like, we were really, really, really worried about it because Apple had everybody's credit cards. Um, it would have been, they could, uh, iTunes was the world's largest music store. They absolutely could have killed Spotify. And they just took this kind of wrong headed, we know what you like approach. It just didn't resonate with people. They're still wildly successful, but they've never caught Spotify. There's another piece of it, I think, this will get me, I think I've already been disqualified from running Apple Music ever. 
<laughs> but um, but this will probably also get me double disqualified. Um, having talked to folks at, at Apple, the other thing I think they is more about the way Apple thinks about software. And they're changing, right? They're, they're trying to change. Apple still comes from this mentality based around hardware releases. Apple Music is not tied to hardware releases. It continues to update. But the updates are much more kind of you know, I talked a lot about iteration and lean and trying things out in the market. And Spotify does that. Absolutely. They try new stuff. They launch it in a very small set of countries. They launch it before it's ready to just get feedback and see how it's working, right? It's a very lean startup style approach. Apple Music comes still, I think, a bit, maybe it's changing, but I haven't seen it yet. This Johnny I, or not Johnny, yeah, Johnny I've kind of like, we're going to make it. We're going to design it to be perfect, and then we're going to give it to you when it's ready, which is great. Certainly, Apple's a tremendously successful company. It's worked well for them. But I think what's holding Apple Music back is we we conceptualize this big thing, and then we give it to you. And it takes us six months or eight months or however long it takes us to make it and hand it to you. And if you don't like it, okay, well, that's fine. But we just waste eight months. So I was like, we're going to do this in three weeks and see if you like it. You don't like it? Cool. All right. We wasted three weeks. You do like it? Okay. Maybe you'd like it more if we did it this way. So Spotify maybe is more of like the startup concept, so to speak. Absolutely. And that's changed. And Spotify is getting closer to, you know, much bigger company, getting closer to Apple. Apple, hopefully, I, is learning some of those lessons or trying to be a little bit more iterative. But if you look at the pace of new innovation coming out of either of these platforms, Spotify is still lapping Apple all the time so both in your current role and roles in our past how have you made sure like you took the time to, like mentally de- I mean, professionally to develop your people what's your like, what's your process for that it's um there's it's going to depend on the, the company um and kind of how much uh how much ex- exists when i show up and what needs to be built Right. So generally it can range from lots of different things in at, uh, at Avo, we built a whole mentoring network, peer to peer mentoring. We also taught classes because teaching, uh, testers, how to write code, things like that at other companies like, oh, we actually had a, a strong L and D team and we were able to leverage learning and development, able to leverage them and have them actually teach classes and do stuff like that where we didn't have to do as much on our own. It's going to depend on also the makeup. So today I have a pretty senior team. I've, I've sort of a team that's either very, very senior or very, very, uh, not very, very junior, but more on the junior side and no kind of in the middle. So I have some folks that really aren't looking necessarily for development. And I have a bunch of folks that are looking for a lot of it. And so we do a lot of kind of mentoring from senior to junior, but we haven't formalized it yet in the way that I have at other companies, but we're, that may be something we do more of. So you do, you're doing a lot, right? How do you make sure you take care of yourself or what do you do to take care of yourself either physically or mentally? Um, now there's a joke I like, but I'm going to be saying right now I'm sarcastic. Uh, well, I, I drink. Um, <laughs> it's news radio, but um, no, it's it's again it's evolved over time because of how I came into the industry in the '90s and you know my early career. Yeah, we worked a lot. Like I worked. A lot. That was expected. I literally slept under my desk at multiple companies. Uh, uh, we death marched in Microsoft. Right? I learned very much the hard way of what it means to not do that. You know, I finished a project at a company and spent literally three months just staring at a wall. I finished it, got it out. I, I'd worked so many hours, so many days. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't look at my computer. I would come to work, get to work on time, sit down and just stare at the wall because I couldn't look at my computer. And it took me like a a good month before I could kind of 
start to get back into it. So I learned by hitting the wall that I couldn't, you know, sort of what it started to look like when I was doing that. These days, um, I'm much more careful, uh, or careful. I'm much more careful. Just invented a new word. Yeah. I'm much more careful about it. Um, I'm more conscious of myself. I have a family now. My family lets me know if I'm working too much, right? I have to say being distributed, working from home helps a lot. Um, it helps and doesn't help, right? It, it helps because I don't have to take a bus downtown and spend, you know, 45 minutes or an hour commuting each way. Um, and then, you know, well, I want to avoid the traffic. Maybe I'll just work a little bit more or whatever. And also I'm getting home at like 730 or 8 at night. Um, so that helps, right? I can, I can literally, the dog is whining at the door. I got to go take the dog for a walk, right? So that kind of stuff, right here, my, my kid get home from school. I'm like, all right, what, what do I have on my schedule? You know what? I can take a break and go see how their day went. That kind of stuff is available to me in a way that that's helped, right? For a lot of other people, they don't like it, but for me, it, it's helped. But it's also just being self-aware and self-conscious and, and realizing when that's starting to happen. I meditate. I, you know, make sure I go for a walk in the woods. Like I said, I live near woods. Take the dog for a walk in the woods every day. That helps. Um, and just try and maintain perspective. And sometimes still, something's going on. I'm going to end up working more hours. But, you know, I also am much more conscious of, you know, I just worked 60 hours or 70 hours last week. I got done what I need to get done. I'm not going to do 40 hours this week. I'm going to maybe do 30 hours. I'm going to maybe do a little bit less, just kind of recome, ease back into it and then kind of get back to normal. I, I overcorrected. I need to correct back the other way. This is how those bosses out there are like, okay, I know you work 70 hours this week, but you got to work 40 hours. Every day. Yep. Like, okay. There are those bosses. I'm yeah. not one of those bosses. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. If you work 70 hours this week, plus a lot of stuff, I would expect be told, hey, work less, right? Yeah. But a lot of bosses still is after that. Like what I call the 1980s mentality, you know? And and again, like I started my first job was like it, my first job out of college was 1992. Very much that mentality. Absolutely that mentality. And so, yeah, I did that for a long time. So as a supervisor, how do you handle how you deal with like the different generations of the workforce, different cultures? How do you like handle all that? Because it's a lot, right? Because boomers think it's a one lot. way. Generation Z thinks one way, you know, people from Mexico, Sweden, whatever case, they're, they're yeah. all different. How do you make sure all that comes together to be like a cohesive and like a team that does stuff? It's a challenge. It's absolutely a challenge. And and you brought up an important point, which is my team isn't all in the U.S. Like my team is in, my current team is in the U.S., in Switzerland, in Israel, in uh, uh, Australia, in Cyprus. I got you know, people all over the world um, that are all part of that team in the UK. And so each of those has a very distinct, different culture and a different way of interacting with each other. And, you know, I think one of the benefits of tech over the years is this is not a new phenomenon. I think it's accelerated. COVID certainly accelerated it, but before then, before COVID, I was working in the UK. My team was in the UK, New Mexico, and Portugal, right? Three completely different cultures, but they all had to work together. So it wasn't that uncommon um, prior. It's accelerated since COVID, since distributed teams become have become more and more of a thing. But I think what you end up have, having happen is you find sort of the ambient Kind of culture that becomes sort of a um that everyone sort of adapts to so americans maybe get you know swedes are kind of like germans maybe in some ways where they're a little bit more literal literal they're a little bit more forthright um they'll just tell you what they think um but maybe they swedes unlike germans won't tell you what they think till they for a long time um, they're more consensus driven, Americans, not so much consensus driven. And what you end up finding is that I think people, as they get to work to with each other, they sort of, you end up defining a new culture that's kind of common across everybody. 
Um, and we all kind of adapt. So I got having worked with lots of different cultures for many years now, you get really good at kind of sensing, you, you get a little, you get good you, at sensing what this culture needs, what they, what's expected. And you make some mistakes, right? And you be very open about, and you know, when you make a mistake saying it and, and you want to learn, I ask questions. I want to ask like, are you very literal? But I'll sort of ask questions about different things and try and understand people. And if you come with an open mind, people usually are very happy to, you know, give you some grace if you say something wrong or do something in a way that they don't like. Um, and if you make yourself open, they'll tell you when, hey, you know, this, this is not something I, pre you know, I, I understand why you did this, but this, if you don't mind not doing that that way in the past, right? Or in the future. And so it's just practice. Honestly, it's just practice. But I think tech in particular, I also noticed, I noticed this in Sweden because I'd worked with folks from India and I'd worked with folks from Israel and I worked with folks from other places, Germany and stuff before I moved to Sweden. But what I think I realized in Sweden was because Spotify had people from Sweden, from France, like from all over the EU, right? They were importing people from the US, like all these different countries, including like the Baltic states and Russia and stuff like that. And all, you know, in the same building working together on teams. And what I started to realize is, and this is maybe unique about tech, there was sort of an like geek culture that kind of transcended all of it. So, you know, you can go to England and you can talk to talk to some meet somebody in a, in a pub and talk to them about baseball and they don't know anything about baseball, right? They they want to talk to you about football or soccer, right? You can go to pretty much any tech company and back then when I was there, like talk about Game of Thrones and everybody knows what you're talking about, right? <laughs> and so, you know, there were those kind of common touchstones that everybody kind of knew and then that let people kind of find that place with each other. So there is that kind of common culture. And I've seen that when I give talks in France or I give talks here, or give talks there where I'm dealing with these cultures that I maybe haven't worked with a ton of people from before, like uh, Bulgaria, I gave a talk in Bulgaria and met a bunch of people there. And so it's like, okay, like you, 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 the way you do stuff is really different. Like the way your companies work is really different, but we can all agree that, you know, uh, you know, Iron Man is better than Spider-Man or something like that. I don't feel that way. That's just an example. Yeah. But, and we all have that common kind of common touchstone. So you talk about, you have people in Israel, like how do you deal with situations like that where something obviously bad is going on? Yeah. But do you like, hey, you know, I know this is going on in your country, but you still have to perform the same way, same expectation. You, you can't do that. Or do, or do you like, hey, you know what? I mean, you don't lower expectations, of course, but like, how does that work, right? And then yeah, how do you deal with, okay, Someone is just, hey, you know, you got a lot of shit going on, like take your business and someone like, we'll say Mexico, what's going on, right? Like, yeah. how do, how, why does he get like, perform less? It, it, there's a war, but I have this going over here, right? So, you know, and when, when the Ukraine war started, I did, there was a big team from, from my prior company. We had a big team in Ukraine, right? And we had people dialing into meetings from bomb shelters while bombs were going off overhead. We, you know, in uh, uh, one of the people I work with now, yeah, he, you know, I'll be talking to him and say, oh, uh, I got to go over here. And he goes into, he has a bomb shelter in his house. He goes to the bomb shelter. Like the alarms go off and he goes to the bomb shelter. And it's just like, it's weird, you know, because it's, it, it you just have to deal with it, but you cannot. You Like, it'd be stupid. There's no way. Imagine, imagine putting yourself in that place and like somebody's like, you know, hey Jason, I didn't get the I didn't get this report. I was expecting this report, and oh, it wasn't formatted correctly. And you got like machine guns going talk off about, around. Talk you. about jackass mode. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh my god, like, what kind of robot are you? You got like, you got to be human for people. And so, what my experience has been, and I, I can't talk to anybody else's company. I can't talk to anybody else's team. Um, the way I would approach it, the way I do approach it, is this is effed up. And I have no idea what you're going through. I just know you're going through some. And to the extent you can work or you want to work, awesome. And to, and if, if right now 
like something's going on you can't do it okay like that like i get it like okay cool you know please communicate please let people know what they can expect of you if something comes up let people know so we're not waiting on you or don't know what's going on what i have found both in ukraine and israel and i imagine you know no matter where either people appreciate like one people you treat people like humans they absolutely appreciate it. and they will generally try and you know work right because they appreciate that you're giving them that grace and they want to earn it like i don't know what's going to happen next week right now i can get work done i'm going to get work done you know and i know i may not be able to so i'm i'm going to work now or I'm going to work harder now because I got, you know, there's no bombs going off above me. So, okay, cool. Um, but you give them that grace and they, they work what they can, and, but they appreciate that they're being treated, you know, they appreciate being treated like humans and, and you giving them that empathy. Their peers also feel the same. I've never had somebody so they go, notice what you're doing with other people, right? Yeah. And they also know, like, you, you know, you lost your, your parent, like, yeah, go, like, Go do what you got to do. Let us know when you're going to be back and take the time you need, right? Um, we want to treat, you know, I want to treat you the way I would like to be treated. My my mom passed. I was living in Stockholm. My mom passed or my mom was dying with brain cancer. I flew back. I worked from Chicago for three, four weeks because I wanted to be there to help. And I was working with Sweden, but that's what I had to do. And there was no question. There was no challenge. There was no doubt. And when she finally passed, I was in an offsite. I got a phone call. I stepped out, got the message, said, Hey, I got to go left. Took a, we were not near where I lived, took a train home, went home, said I'm booking, you know, on the train, booked a flight back, flew back, was gone another week. You know, and there was no, it was fine. Yeah, It was understanding. And so because I've received that support and I did, you know, the whole time I was in Chicago, I was working my butt off because I so appreciated somebody doing that for me. You don't me. realize when coming to do that, how much more your work is going to perform for you versus, you know, the other way. Yeah. And was I as effective? No, because I'm sitting in, you know, my parents' house on crummy internet, but I didn't want to, you know, I was there. I could spend time with my parents. I could do what I needed to do. And then I appreciated that. And so, yeah. And so then I gave that, you know, I wanted to work hard to, to thank the company for giving me that grace. So because of that, it, it's very easy for me to, to sort of understand, even if I don't know what it's like to live in a war zone, I do know what it's like for, to have a company give a crap about you and support you and, you know, and so I want to do that for, for the people who work for me. So next question, best you can. Can you talk about how District Kid got started? What y'all focus on now with the future business for your, for the company? So District Kid got started uh, about over 10 years now, uh, like 11 plus years ago. So it was started by Philip Kaplan. He uh, had a startup guy, like he'd done other startups, New York based, was also a musician wanted to release some music, tried to use one of our competitors. It was an unfulfilling experience to say the least. And it was like, this isn't that hard. Why is, you know, the kind of fundamental founder problem, right? Founder realization, this isn't that hard. Why are they making this hard? And also why are they charging me so much money to do this? Because it's not that hard. So he decided to build his own and he did. And then grew the company very slowly for a long time. As more and more people started using it, like added, slowly added, slowly added, slowly added. And then a few years ago, you know, finally, you know, the company was growing and growing and growing and finally decided, okay, well, took in a bit of investment, grew the company a bit. Like we're not huge, but it grew the company a bit more to kind of support the, the new users. And, you know, his, speaking of pragmatism, right? Like he, when I was looking at the company, obviously I, I was come from, I've been in music for a long time, was excited to go back to music, was excited to work with some of these people that I knew and wanted to work with again. But also he was a huge part of it. Like 
I remember like he interviewed me for several, he, he and I had like a several hour conversation again, like didn't bother me. Like, yeah, like, of course you want to spend that time. Like you need to know me. I need to know you. So one of the things he said that was like, work should never ruin your day, which was like, kind of like, well, yeah, but also like, yeah, that should be on a postcard, but also like, yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Like work should never ruin your day. And it was absolutely true. And it was like, okay, like I understand how he sees this and what he cares about and what he cared about the culture and building a company that people were excited to work at. Anyway. Um, and you know, it was interesting for me is it wasn't the first technical founder I've worked for, but certainly, um, you know, a very different kind of technical founder. I, I spoke of pragma pragmatism. He calls it Yagni. Um, you aren't going to need it, which is kind of a, a software developer term for like, don't overbuild, build what you actually need, not the thing that you think you're going to need someday. Cause it, then you spent, you waste a lot of time building something that's usually not fit for purpose. Cause you're trying to predict the future, but that's a, essentially at its core, a very pragmatic approach to stuff. So it resonated with me as well. They have a very lean kind of way of building software and it's music first. And it's a lot of musicians work at the company. I love working with fellow musicians and we get to geek out about this pickup versus that pickup or like this band or that band all these kinds of things. Um, over the years, it's continued to grow, but the fundamental thing we do is we get music from artists, we put it in the various streaming and stores, they pay us, we pay the artists. What we do. And we've gotten better at it. We've also gotten better at giving those artists tools to help them understand what's going on and also help them help their music sound better, things like that. We do video distribution, specifically music video distribution as well, but people use it for other things. So, you know, we continue to grow and add new services, but fundamentally we're there um, to support musicians. So I ran a question. When I was growing up, MTV was a big thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's been a music video on MTV in 20,000 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, did anything take the place of MTV? Is that like a channel out there? Like this, YouTube. Is, YouTube, this is YouTube now? Okay. YouTube. YouTube, yeah, yeah, it's YouTube. Um, Somebody might, somebody else might say TikTok. Yes, also TikTok, but eh, YouTube. Well, there's nothing really on TV though, right? There's no like channel on TV that does it, right? Not that I know. Of. Okay. Yeah. Every once in a while, um, like when you're traveling or something, you'll be watching weird satellite TV or yeah. cable in a hotel yeah. room and you'll stumble upon a yeah. music video channel. Yeah. But yeah, as far as like an MTV. I often wonder thing. like what, who made the decision at MTV, like go from music videos, like all these like documentaries and it does, is MTV even a run anymore? Because I haven't, I just I don't need my channels or anything. Like, I, I haven't, had, I mean, you're talking the wrong person. I haven't, had, I, haven't, I haven't had cable in, shoot, I haven't had cable in 20, a long time. Yeah, 20 years. Okay. Maybe? Yeah. All right. So moving on, let's talk about this book you just wrote. Oh, yes. All right. Um, so it depends. First, right. I don't know which camera I'm showing. Sure. Okay. Why, why write a book, right? This is something you like felt call to do to give out your knowledge or like what was the process? It's a, uh, so I mentioned blogging. I blog, I've been blogging, uh, since early two thousands for a long time. And originally I was just blogging about random stuff. Um, just, I don't know why, cause I was kind of interested in the idea. I, I, uh, back in the day I had a zine, like a photocopy zine back in the days when we did that stuff. Um, so maybe I thought of it that way. I don't know. Somewhere in this kind of time where I moved from being a software developer to starting to really think about being a manager and I'd manage people, but now I was really like, nope, management is my career. I want to be good at it. And I was starting to learn more. One of the things I found was this blog called Rands and Repos, which was written by this guy who, uh, is a, was a manager at Apple. He didn't say where he worked, but that's where he was. And he wrote about management and people management and in tech. And I started, well, yeah, this is really good. And I started realizing like, well, you know, I, I, he's, I agree with what he's saying, but I have a slightly different take on it or I'm thinking about this. And I started to mix in more management, like tech management as I was learning things and starting to do it. So I was starting to do that. 
somewhere in there, I started giving the talks. Um, I'm not a great writer. I'll, I'll say this. I'm not like there are not, there are tech bloggers, tech management bloggers who write every day. I don't. I'm like, I think a couple of years ago I had a goal, like I'm going to write one blog post a month and I struggled. I made it, but it was really hard. Like I don't write a lot because it's just, it's not fun. It's not as fun for me as speaking. Um, but I, you know, persisted and, you know, there's some stuff I liked and there was some stuff people were reading and they're like, Hey, I read that thing. It was really great. I was getting that kind of positive feedback. Um, during COVID, right. So, um, like, like us all, I got all this time on unexpected amount of time and I'm looking and I'm kind of looking through some stuff and I realized like I was maybe writing a blog post and I realized like, Oh wow. Like over the years, I've actually written a lot of stuff, um, that people have liked or that I like. And I real and people had asked me at this point, cause I give a talk and people's, Oh, well, when are you going to write a book or people I mentor are like, Oh, you should write a book. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, you know, someday I should, but all right. But I don't know. I got, I don't have that kind of time. Uh, but then I started looking through all these blog posts. And I'm like, you know what, actually, there's something here and a lot of this stuff still relevant, right? Maybe I've changed a little bit. I might not say it this way. Maybe, you know, this is a little bit different, but a lot of these things are actually pretty evergreen. And so I start collecting those posts and kind of, well, maybe this will be the book, right? As a, as a first book, not the worst way to approach it. Right. And again, like, if you look at uh, the hard thing about hard things, which is another like tech leadership or, you know, software company leadership book that I liked, you know, it was just a collection of his blog posts, right? Ben Horowitz's blog posts. Um, and so I'm like, well, I guess that is a, you know, reasonable thing or, or Joel Spolsky had a book that was just a collection of his blog posts. Okay. Like that is a thing that people do. And okay. So I started working on it. I started like, okay, maybe that's what I'll do. I started collecting them said, okay, well, I write way better today than I ever used to because I've done it more. So maybe, you know, I'm not going to just take these and put them as is. I'm going to go through and clean up the grammar. I don't want to change the meaning of it, but some of this writing is embarrassing to me. Like, so I'm going to clean it up a little bit. Late in the la last few years, I've had editors, you know, edit it before I post stuff often. But, um, but I didn't. I was just writing stuff and writing it poorly. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to clean up the language, but I'm going to keep it the exact same thing I said. I'm just going to say it slightly more understandably. So I, that ended up taking me way longer than I expected, partially because if writing isn't a fun thing for me, editing is <laughs> definitely not a fun thing for me. So it took me way longer than I meant to, but eventually I got it all together. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's the book. It's 10 years. It's not everything I wrote in, in these 10 years. Uh, it's not everything I wrote in these 10 years, but it's, um, certainly quite a lot of it. And the stuff that I think is still relevant, still interesting, still valuable. Um, I have my greatest hits are in there. It's like, there's a, you know, stuff that has been, you know, really well received. So, and I figure, you know, it'll help, it'll be helpful for people. Hopefully like there's a lot of people on this journey. And now there's a lot more resources that exist than when I started. There was literally like two books on tech management, on like building a career in tech management. And they were both horrible. I read both of them. Um, now there's a billion of them, but you know, I still think I come at it from a different perspective and it's called, it depends writing on technology leadership, 2012 to 2022 by me, Kevin Goldsmith. It's available March 4th, but you can pre-order it now pretty much everywhere. Um, and you'll, it'll ship to you on March 4th. So who did you write this book for? Do you have like a, you know, what's it called? The ICP, like a custom profile, so to speak, right? I wrote this book for me, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I wrote this book for the people that come af come up to me after I give a talk on something and ask and start asking me questions. And it used to be I'm like, oh yeah, let's have a conversation. We'll talk about that. And now I'm like, well, I wrote this blog post, right? Called this, you should go. Yeah, let's talk about it. But I'm kind of repeating what I already said in that blog post. 
and or when I'm mentoring somebody and um, they say, oh, well, how does this work? And I'm like, well, let me send you a link to the blog post I already wrote about that. And we can also discuss it, but you know, I'm just going to repeat what I said there. I was starting to find that happen more and more. And I'm like, you know what? Like this stuff is still meaningful. A lot of people who are in a tech management career, maybe they have more resources. There's more blogs, there's more books, but you know, they're still, it's not whatever they have access to. They're not getting their questions answered. So maybe I can add to that and just add to the knowledge. Do you use like a traditional book publisher for this or Amazon? This one's self-published. So the reason I wanted to do that, there's a little bit of, um, you know, I mentioned I ran a record label, right? I, I had a zine. There's, um, because of, I came up in this very DIY kind of aesthetic, do it like, all right, like I thought about maybe I should go to this, pub there's publishers I like and I respect. Maybe we should go to this publisher, this publisher, to this publisher, and see if I can get them interested in it. And then there was a part of me that's like, well, then they're going to have what they need from me. And they're going to, because I've contributed to other people's books. So I kind of knew how, and, and I've had people who write books, who've written books who were working for me at the time. So I kind of knew how that worked, not exactly, but a bit. And I'm like, Okay, but they're going to want me to do this on their schedule, even if I can get them interested. I'm going to have to go sell it around. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm still going to have to mostly write it in order to do that. I'm going to spend a lot of time on it. And then, like, they're going to need me to do this and this and this on this schedule. And, you know, again, this took me longer than it should because there are parts where I just stopped working out for months at a time because I was either busy or just didn't, you know, was, didn't feel like it. Um. I didn't want to be letting somebody else down. But also, I think that kind of started my own record label idea and like wrote my own zine and published my own blog and all these kinds of things. There's a part of me that's like, I don't, I want to just see how this works myself. And I can do this and I can also make it cheaper. It turns out the markups on it make it pretty hard to make it cheaper. Um, but I can make it cheaper because I also didn't want to take down my blog posts because if, if I was a publisher, I'd say, this is great. All this content is available for free on your website. You need to take it all down because otherwise, why would somebody buy the book? I'm like, I don't give a crap. If they want to read it on my blog, that's awesome. This isn't about, you know, this is the only way to get this knowledge. This is like, this is just a way easier way to get it all. And it's, a, and you know, it's cleaner and it's easier to read because I've cleaned it up. But you know, it's, I didn't want to take down that stuff. I want, I didn't want anybody else telling me how to do it. I want to do it myself. Am I going to sell less copies because of it? Totally. Absolutely. Um, but that's fine by me. Um, I'm the only one who's put money into it. I'm the only one who's going to lose money into it, but I also have been very smart about it and tried to run it like a business. Um, and no, you know, I know how to do that. I'm all right. I'm going to, this will be a great learning experience for me. And then the next book, Okay, like that one, I can either choose depending on how this goes. Oh, maybe I'll publish it myself because I don't need some, I know how to do it now. Or I can go to somebody else and say, hey, this was my first book. This is how well it did. Would you be interested in doing my next book? This is what I want to write about. And then maybe I'll try it that way instead. So from your point of view, what would make this book a success? Would it be like the number of book sales? Would it be like someone like emailing you out of the blue? Hey, you don't know me, but this book changed my life and blah, 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 anything like that. Right. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll also say, so I mentioned I have a podcast, I have a podcast and a newsletter, both of these things. The podcast is serializing the audio book of the book. So if you listen to all the podcasts, you will get the entire audio book. They're not, no, uh, they're in, and they're in order. Actually, the podcast is in order. The newsletter also serializing the book, which by the way, still on my blog not in order, right? So the blog, the newsletter and the podcast have different chapters on different weeks, but both of them, you want to sit and subscribe to either of them. You'll get all the knowledge. I kind of just want the knowledge out. What would be successful for me would be somebody reads it. Somebody reads it, gets some value from it. They want to email me if to tell me awesome. They don't want to email me. That's fine too. Um, I just want to help get the knowledge into the world. If I can, I'm trying to run this like a business. 
I'm also being careful what I spend. If I end up being profitable and that wouldn't take much, that'd be great. But I'm, and, and by the way, like to do this, I'm pricing it basically about as low as I could. It's still more than I would like, but there's a point where like, they won't let you price it cheaper. Um, and the markups on these, like compared to CDs is because I have that experience is wow, ridiculous, but okay. But that's the way it works. Um, so I'm learning. And so, okay. Like, but I would price it cheap. It's free. You can get it free three different ways, but you, if you want to pay for it, the idea is you can pay for it. And you're really, what you're doing is saying either the convenience of having it all in one place, either ebook or print book, or even I'd be fascinated, but hardcover, right. Get, or audiobook, get it how you want it. And if you're willing to spend the money to, for the convenience, but also just to say, you know, thank you for putting this out into the world. That's great. So for writing this book, did you learn anything about yourself that you didn't already know? Yeah. Um, I learned how much, like, I learned I'm not a writer. Uh, no, I mean, I learned, uh, I learned one, how much, I am a much better writer than I used to be. Uh, it's interesting. Like, it's one thing to be aware. Oh, yeah, I wrote this blog post about uh, doing performance reviews. Actually, that's not a good one because I wrote a couple years ago, but... I wrote this one blog post about this thing, how I hire developers or what I look for. There's a chapter on what do I look for when hiring a developer, where I tell this whole story uh, that I told on this, um, on the podcast. Uh, and I, you know, I, that was a long time ago. I was, I'm a much better writer than I was then. And so that part's really interesting, like seeing how much more work I had to do to kind of express my thoughts or clear up how I was trying to express my thoughts. That was really interesting to me because I don't really think of myself as a, as a writer. Um, even though I write a lot and I write for work all the time. Um, that was really interesting to me that to give me a little bit more confidence, maybe make it a little bit less scary to look at a blank page again. Um, that was one of the things I absolutely learned, but I think I also, uh, this DIY thing, it's been a while since I've done something like this. And no, it's still in me. Like it's still, I still like this idea of me not having to, you know, me doing it myself and not having to wait, let somebody else kind of tell me how to do it. I get to do it the way I want to do it. If it works great. Awesome. If it doesn't work at all. Okay. That's fine. Maybe I'll do it differently next time. Maybe I won't do another book. Maybe I'll do 50 books. I don't know. Tell us again, how people can order your book. The best way, the easiest way is to go to itdependsbook.net. One word. So the book is called It Depends. Um, you can also Google It Depends Writing on Technology Leadership or right, It Depends Kevin Goldsmith. Uh, there are a lot of books. I didn't realize this. Uh, I, one of my lessons. There's a lot of books called It Depends. Um, none called this exactly. But so if you look, look on that, there's a reason why it's it depends book.net. Let me put it that way. Um, but for that, um, that has links to, you know, not every store. It is now literally on the pre order on stores all over the world. You can also go to your local independent bookstore and ask for it and they'll order it for you. Um, or you can go to, you know, Amazon, you can get pre-order the ebook today. You can go to Barnes & Noble, pre-order the, the book today. You can go to bookstershop.org, which also lets you specify your local independent bookstore to get a cut and order it from there and pre-order it. Um, but on March 4th, you'll be able to just order it from everywhere, including paperback and hard. Is this book back. in like different languages too? Like how does that? How, no, how, I haven't how, done that like yet. How does that work? You know? I do know from friends of mine who, who've written books. So there's different ways if I really decide I want to go and do a, a Spanish version or French version or I something. I think you would do a Swedish version or nothing else. Uh, well, one thing I, I'll <laughs> tell you from living in Sweden is pretty much everyone in Sweden learns English. So okay. yeah, they don't need okay. me to do that. Okay. I'm not, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, if I wanted to do like a Spanish version or whatever, um, I would either choose to go hire a company to translate it for me. And then, and then I could just produce the Spanish version of it. Um, or, uh, you know, I know for other books, sometimes people volunteer to do individual chapters or whatever I could do, or I could kind of crowdsource it if there was a lot of interest in it. But 
you know, I'm going to see how we do with English. And if there is interest, yeah, maybe we'll do it. But it's going to be like a art rate, you know, ROI kind of decision to make of, because then I'm spending, you know, then I'm spending money to do it. And do I think I'll sell enough books to cover that cost? So how do you do this, right? You know, obviously, you have a lot going on, a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. From your job, family, friends, music, yeah, yeah, yeah. books, whatever, you know, important to your CEO, whatever case it be. Like, right. how on a daily basis do you make sure you, you work on the stuff that needs to be worked on versus, you know, priority number 10,001, right? You know, it's, it's like anything else you do. I, I would say up until maybe October of last year, it was really oh, a hobby. All right, well, I got some time this weekend. I'll go through and kind of work on the book for a little bit. And I would set goals for myself. I'm going to do this many chapters. And I just missed the goals because other stuff was keeping me busy or whatever. So again, because no one else, like I wasn't, contracted to a book publisher and they were waiting on me i'm like i didn't have to feel guilty about it but also because i didn't have somebody saying hey kevin where's the book hey kevin where's the book um there also wasn't the same sense of urgency so it took me away uh, it took me way longer than if i'd really said nope this is what i'm doing gotta get it done i want to get it out by this date super hard, work on it super hard so you know i do a little bit here a little bit there a little bit here made progress over time and then somewhere in the fall i'm like I decided, you know, I'd be really great to get out this year. I really want to get out this year, maybe for Christmas. I'm going to try and see if I can get out this year. And I started working much harder on it. And I realized, I think I can get out this year, but it's going to come out of Christmas and no one's going to care because a lot of things come out of Christmas. And also I'm not going to be able to promote it well. I'm not going to be able to get people, you know, no one's going to know about it. So again, also from having the experience doing record releases, like I understand a little bit about sequencing and setting them up and getting and getting promotion in place and doing these kinds of things. So I said, you know what, uh, I can do it. I know I can get it done. I don't think I want to get it done. I think I'd rather have time to do it right. So I'd pick the March 4th date. The book was done before the end of the year. And then since then, a lot of what I've been working on is getting the audiobook recorded and edited. Uh, it should be ready on March 4th. We're getting it close. I'm not 100% sure, but it'll be ready soon. Um, and then saying like, but the book was ready, got the proofs back, made sure started working on the promotion, the podcast, the, the thing and promoting those as ways of promoting the book. And I'm just going to, and putting an advertising plan together, all that kind of stuff, which I think people tend to forget about, but because I have this experience putting out my, putting out other people's and my own kind of music, I remember it's different for books, but it's not. There's similarities there. And so, yeah, so I picked that March 4th date. And ever since then, I've just been like, okay, like that, that's given me that sense of urgency, and especially once I felt confident and started announcing it publicly. Yeah, no, and I, it's got to get done. And so that's been great. So what's, um, so was a book writing process a pretty fun process for you or like just like tolerable or? Um, because I kind of cheated this one, cause like I said, it's like, I've already written, the, I, I wrote the book before I ever wrote yeah. the book. It was already all there. I just had to assemble it and edit it and put it in the right order and choose what I was going to drop and what I was going to keep. So it was really editing an, a book as opposed to writing a book. But I'll tell you the experience of doing it, um, has very much like got me excited about writing another book. So, and that one would be from scratch like i'm going to write about something i don't want to talk about it till i'm yeah. actually doing it yeah. because i don't want to say and then it never happens but yeah so i am more excited about that and i think what it also taught me you were asking like what i learned about myself and i kind of knew this a little bit but i i understand a lot more it isn't that other people who are writing books about this kind of stuff are wrong Although sometimes I read their stuff and go, wow, this is wrong. But it's but it's right for them. It's their truth, right? I don't think they're lying to people. I don't think they're making stuff up. I think they're looking at the world through their experience and saying, you need to do this. And I look at it from my experience and go, wow, you really shouldn't do that. Because I know that doesn't always work, right? And if you tell people this, and that's another reason why the book is called It Depends. You heard me say It Depends, not because I was trying to get the title of the book in this conversation because it is true like your local context 
the context of Cabinets HR versus DistroKid, totally different company. But if I told you, well, Jason, you need to evaluate developers in this way, this is the way you evaluate developers, it'd be ludicrous. It'd be totally wrong. Totally different company. Right. And that was what I missed a lot of in other people's books. It was like, this is the way you do this thing. I'm like, that's not a good way to do it at my company. If I did it this way, it wouldn't work. And I know this because either I tried it or because I understand that. So everything I've tried to do, and I think what I learned about myself is it isn't, uh, it's that, it isn't that I know how to do it and no one else knows how to do it. It's that I understand it's really contextually dependent and my own experience doing it five different ways I can tell you kind of the ideas you need to think about when you figure out how to do it for yourself instead of solving the problem. for you. And so that's kind of this area that I'm realizing it's not that it's completely under unrepresented, but it's not well represented. And that is sort of what I can bring to this discussion. And so you can read my book and somebody else's book and somebody else's book. And from all of them, you can sort of assemble what makes sense for you but I'm going to be the one that tells you, well, this is what you got to think about here. And this is what you got to think about here. And this is what you got to think about here. And this is my own experience trying it this way. And that's how it worked in this place. And you can go, oh, okay, cool. Maybe I don't do it exactly the way Kevin did it. Cause I would tell you, don't do it the way I did it, but learn from, you know, but this is what happened to me when I tried it this way. Maybe you can take, and it worked for me, it might not work for you, but you can take the idea. Why did I do it this way? And say like, okay, like, I won't do it exactly that way, but I'll do something different that makes more sense for me, like who I am as a manager, who I am as a leader, or the company that I'm in and our company culture, which is different than this story that Kevin told me about Ava or Spotify or whatever. So in the future, do you think there's be a time where like you start working, stop doing stuff, you just on the porch drink your beer? Or do you think you're going to be like, maybe not working, but you, you'll be doing stuff until like the day before you're no longer with us? I don't know, man. Um, I love, I love what I do. Uh, I really enjoy doing what I do. And uh, someday I won't do it. Someday I'll do something else. But I've been doing this. I've been a CTO for eight years. I've been in the software industry for 32 years. Um, I've been a manager for like 15, 20 years. I, I love what I do. At some point, I would like to, you know, do less being on video calls and stuff like that. Maybe that turns into my own company. Maybe that in my own, a, a small, like I wouldn't try and start a series CD. I mean, maybe it's a small company or maybe I do a lot of mentoring. I do a lot of speaking, doing more writing. Um, maybe it turns into that. I don't know. But for now, I just like being a CTO. I like working with other people. I like building cool things in, in that people like. I'm going to keep doing that for a while, but yeah, someday I'll, I'll do not that. Yeah. Kevin, is there anything else I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about that you haven't covered yet? Oh gosh, this has been such a wide ranging conversation and, um, uh, no, I think that, you know, uh, no, it's been great. Cool. Kevin, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Yes. The easy, so there is, it depends book.net. Great place to look info about the book. You can find me, kevingoldsmith.com, uh, which is easy because my name's in the title of the podcast. Uh, just my name.com. That has my links to LinkedIn, to Twitter, to Mastodon, to Threads, to Instagram, to YouTube. All those links are there. So do you have a like? Oh, but I'll, I will tell you generally because, again, because I'm old, uh, generally you can almost everywhere find me at Kevin Goldsmith username kevin goldsmith on every one of those sites i think on linkedin i'm goldsmith for some reason do you have like a favorite social media right now because there's all these social like the macedon threads i think the thing called blue sky that oh yeah no yeah people. i'm on blue sky too yeah yeah. i think i'm oh, i might be kmg on one yeah. of them yeah yeah do you have a favorite one that you like to use for whatever reason um you know i i it, it, it would have been hands down no question twitter like three years ago now it's less and less Twitter, more threads, but not, I don't know. I like, 
you haven't gone on threads i'm like man like zuckerberg has another social media thing like, yeah uh, you know it's i really wanted mastodon to be successful i really i really do i like the idea of decentralized i like the idea i mean i like blue sky too i'd, lo I'd love for these things to be successful i think mastodon is great for us like what i'm finding today is like blue sky is really good at for finding this kind of content like these kind of communities have adopted it and it could just be who i'm connected to but mastodon's really good for this kind of thing thread seems to be about this and twitter's sort of like this i think um i'm not happy with what elon musk did to the company i'm not happy with that product it's becoming less and less useful for me and more and more spammy and stuff but i think if there's a place i still go to most it's still there um maybe because i'm I'm having to wade through more stuff i don't want to see to get to the stuff i do want to see but it's still more of it there all right hey kevin thanks for being here today. i really appreciate it thanks for yeah coming on. absolutely and to our listeners thanks for your time as well remember to be great every day